Hello, and welcome to Scuttlebutt, the war movie review podcast. We're happy to have you with us as we take a look at films from the dawn of cinema to today. We aim to provide a raw and unapologetic review of each film's cinematography, historical accuracy, and delivery. In the process of analysis, certain details will be revealed. These spoilers are only divulged to ensure a fair assessment of each film. We head back to the South Pacific this week with Terrence Malick's 1998 epic, The Thin Red Line. As always, I'm joined by Mike B. Yep. Nate. The idiot who didn't check his mic input and is now recording his whole audio on a webcam. <laughs> and this week's special guest, former Marine and host of the YouTube channel and Facebook page, Guadalcanal Walking the Battlefield, Dave Holland. Hey there, guys. Welcome to, um, I'm happy to be back again. Discuss the thin red line with you guys. It's good. Thank you so much for joining us, man. You know, and it's a, yeah, this is a really strange movie, you know, and uh, it's just cool to talk about it and also get a bit of the U.S. Army's perspective on the canal because everybody knows about the Marines, but not a lot of people know the Army was there too and very big force. So, but, uh, so guys, what'd you think? I, uh, 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 Brian, I want you to go. I want you to lead off on this one. This one was, uh, there's a reason why I think I've avoided this, and I knew why, but I didn't want to... I tried to keep an open mind, but man, that was interesting. But I want you to lead off. I'm curious. So, yeah, I mean, I saw this movie a long time ago, probably four or five years ago, and I was like, what the hell is this thing? And since I got into filmmaking, I probably watched it about six or seven times because I'm trying to understand it. So I always try to watch films that I don't understand because, like, what the hell is going on? And I really love, but I hate this movie. I love it because I feel like it's the only film that shows that GIs and Pacific and Americans were so out of their depth as far as different cultures and things. You know, like Oklahoma compared to Guadalcanal, the Solomons are two completely different things. Um, so I really love it for that. But on the other end of it, what the hell is going on? Like, it's a movie that really doesn't know what it is. And it's just, I can't put my finger on it. So I just... It's beautifully shot. It's got some really cool scenes. It's got some really strange scenes, but I don't know. Just it's a very mixed bag of a film, and it really shows that even they don't know what they were making at the time. You know, uh, so yeah, that's what my initial thought is. Mike Birch, what do you think about it? Or Mike B? Um, yeah, I, I've seen this several times. Once, you know, I think 10, 11 years ago, and then I watched it a couple years ago just to kind of go well, what was this film that was, you know, around the same time as Saving Private Ryan when that came out? Like, why didn't this get bigger or whatever? And I watched and I was like, okay, cool. The Army at Guadalcanal, interesting. Yep. And then <laughs> watched it again today and was like, oh, now I know why Saving Private Ryan completely outshone or outshined or whatever the hell the word is. Uh, this film at the time. And it was, um, as far as the writing and the, the, the acting and the, whatever the, the plot, like you said, it's like, what the hell are they doing? And it, it was like very apparent today when I rewatched it, I'm like, oof. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. um, it was, yeah. Uh, yeah. And it, it was like, uh, you know, again, like, like I was just saying, like Guadalcanal, everybody thinks of the Marines, and you were saying this too. Like, but like what I think is like Guadalcanal, everybody thinks of the Marines, you know, bam, this huge thing. But the army was there, they were in combat, which, you know, Dave will walk us through, I'm sure, more than any of us could in a little bit. But like, is this the right way to portray the army in combat on Guadalcanal? And that was kind of the thing. I was like, ah. Eh. It's very, not even Hollywood. It's just, um, I don't know the term to, to random as fuck. <laughs> well, it's random. It's just, I think the writing is very weak and there was not a lot of research. There was probably some research done, of course, but like, I don't know the research. It, it seemed like it fell short, especially the way that the, the, uh, soldiers talk to each other. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so. like, I mean, like, I, I mean, this this film, it's like I stayed away from it because I knew it was a weird kind of I've been warned it was been art housey, um, very beautiful. Um, inc I think actually very quite incredible cinematography. 
Um, very yeah. well shot out, very well done. But it almost feels like, to me, I think this is another example of editing. It's either editing or it's direction gone wrong. It's one of the two. It's I, I honestly think it's a, di, uh, a post-production editing direction gone completely off the rails, trying to be something that it isn't. I think this thing actually was filmed to be entirely different in a way because there were whole characters that we had. Uh... So, so to, I guess diving right into it, just real quick for me, it's like I'll give a very brief summary. It's like I I see all the wonderful cinematography in this, and then the editing is just so random, and I understand the the thought behind it. It's supposed to be kind of like inner monologues with. You know, inter uh, thoughts, uh, you know, flashbacking back and forth. But the problem is, is that when you have it, I think the reason why it feels so random is that there are so many characters in this film, and none of them I give a fuck about what happens. Yep. None of them, not a single one, because we don't spend any time developing a relationship watching this film. Everything except for a couple, maybe, maybe that's well, the overdone. only one that you should be forming a relationship is the is the one that uh, is the first one they uh, show which went a wall, and unfortunate, and and through most of the middle of the film, he's non existent. It we're following this mm. guy who has a touching skin fetish with Eowyn from Lord of the Rings, like all freaking goddamn movie, like <laughs> it, that's all it is. And it's like okay, I don't care about this, and so. The film as a whole, pfft, cinematography, wonderful. Um, in terms of historical stuff, and we'll jump right into that, I guess, after Dave kind of gives his intro as well, is that I, I, uh, I, I, to me, to my untrained eye, uh, it looked pretty good. Didn't Nothing screamed at me like no, except for the Vietnam-looking guy with the trench shotgun with his arms cut off two days into the fucking Guadalcanal, but I won't say anything about that. So. Anyway, uh, Dave, I'll hand it off to you. <laughs> Yeah, just like Mike was saying, the movie, when I first seen it when it roughly uh, came out right after Saving Private Ryan. So I think a lot of people had that in their mind as Saving Private Ryan. They do the comparison to Saving Private Ryan. So this movie is very deep. Um, I'm, that's all you can say, um, especially you got to do a lot of thinking about it. It's kind of like Apocalypse Now. There's a lot of deep meanings in this, and you got to watch it a number of times. Uh, to get it. So if you wanted a, a full-on action movie, fast forward to the action scenes. And I did that when I first watched it. And I thought it was a bit weird and strange when the very first time I seen it years ago. Then I watched it a few other times, bits and pieces. And obviously, uh, before this episode of, uh, today we're doing, I watched it in its entirety again. I did fast forward in a couple of places when I started yep. going off the deep end and doing a lot of uh, a thought in it. Um, so I think if you do a comparison to some of the action, other movies in its, in its day and its genre, you know, you're not going to, you know, I'm not going to find much. I guess the actor, uh, sorry, the director, was it, um, Malik? Was that who the director was? Yeah. Yes. Apparently he's supposed to be very, very, um, good, good director. And a lot of people wanted to work for him. And obviously you could see he put a lot of uh, thought into yep. it a bit. I've read the book, The Thin Red Line many, many years ago in high school, and I've read bits and pieces of it since. Um, it does follow along with James Jones' his, his train of thought. And, and I know a lot about James Jones. I have all his, his military records. There's about 70 pages I have, and I'll include all his medical records, and we can discuss that a bit later. And if knowing a bit about James Jones, you can see how this movie and, and how the book went. I mean, this is the second movie he made. The first movie was made in 1964. So I'm halfway through that now um, to try to do some comparison. I didn't finish it in time for, for today's review. And I think we'll get into the combat scenes a bit later and, and how it compares to what actually happened on the ground. And, and I know a bit about that in detail. And, and what they're trying to portray in the action on Guadalcanal that uh, that particular unit was portraying. Um, but yeah, the overall in the movie, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say don't see it, but be prepared to to sit there for a long time and and but the it was nominated for like what six or seven oscars or sorry yeah oscars academy awards i don't know if it won anything it might have won for the cinematography 
Uh, it's beautiful cinematography, especially with the, the green of, of Guadalcanal, because uh, parts of the film was actually made on Guadalcanal, and we can discuss that a bit a bit later. I mean, you see Savo Island a number of times. The villagers were, were all Solomon Islanders, and I've spoke to some of the Solomon Islanders who were actually involved in the making of this uh, when they were small. So it's quite interesting there. But yeah, that's my overall take on the movie. The, uh, ju just, uh, sorry, Brian, go ahead. Just, oh, yeah, yeah. That. just to sum it up, I mean, the best thing I could put this into words was this is the American come and see because it just like really makes you think. It's, it, it's just a very strange movie. And it's interesting too, you bring up Saving Private Ryan and stuff because there are some characters that were in Saving Private Ryan that were in this. Uh, the, the guy that plays the Jewish soldier in Saving Private Ryan who gets stabbed in the end, he's in this film. And he's the guy that, you know, kills himself with morphine. No. Uh, when yeah, no. No. No, it's, no, you uh, can, you, no, you it's, can, it's Band no, of Brothers. It's Band of Brothers Joe Toy. Yeah, it's, it's Band of Brothers. Is that yeah. Joe Thank you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's I was Joe Toy. Yeah, well, yeah, what, what are you talking about? That guy's... <laughs> Swear to God, that's no. the same guy. No, yeah, yeah. that's no, Joe, it's, Joe it's Toy Joe Toy Band of Brothers. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Also, he's Band of Brothers. But no, you know, it's just... It's just very interesting, all these different things. And like Dave mentioned, you know, part of it was filmed in the Guadalcanal. And you can tell. Like, you know, that's why I just, this is the only film that, like, gets that Solomon's look because they filmed part of it in the Solomon's. You know, there's just nothing like that. Um, the Pacific, I mean, it's okay. I think they filmed that in Australia, if I remember. Uh, right. Yeah. The portions for that. Yeah. The, yeah, I'll just mention this now. <clears throat> the places they filmed mm -hmm. is in northern uh, Queensland, which is in Australia. That's where they filmed the majority of the um, Thin Red Line, and same roughly in the same area they filmed the Pacific series, but it matches very good, hmm. very well. Yeah, it's very close too. And while we're at it too, this is like the last film I could think of that's like a big World War II ensemble cast, you know, with like a ton of people that you know, like John C. Riley and things. And you know, Saving Private Ryan had Tom Hanks and a few actors, but like this was a very a lot of big names, like Woody Harrelson and things, and. Uh, it's funny, like when you look up on the, the combat actions for this film or the combat sequences on YouTube, you see the Woody Harrelson scene all the time. But in the film, like that's really his only scene. Like you really don't get introduced to him until right before that combat action and stuff. And uh, yeah. Well, I, I was just going to say the only the, the thing is about this film is like and, and, and yeah, I'm not saying don't see it. I actually enjoyed this film to an extent. But the problems I have with this film mainly are. It, it's hard it, it's hard to be uh, artistic or uh, I guess trying to be emotionally deep again with characters that you don't know or can't form a relationship or or can't don't have time to understand because it's so chaotic and or too many characters and I feel like this film suffers with that because um, you know like you just said with Woody Harrelson he's in it for you know, the whole beginning part, but he really only has that middle scene and he blows his ass off with a grenade. Like, okay, cool. But I don't have any more. I don't, there's no bonding with this character. I don't feel anything for any of these characters dying, except for maybe the one, the, the guy who went AWOL, the guy you're supposed to care about. I don't give a crap about the guy whose wife ditches him and John Deere's him. I don't give a crap. Cause there's no, there's no, there's no, storytelling bonding with any of these characters to me. And it's like, you have all these powerhouse actors, but I formed more relationship with fucking Carparzo than I did with any of these fucking people in Thin Red Line. <laughs> so, I mean, that's just me personally. It's a beautiful film though. It's, and it's very deep. It tries to be very deep. And I think it does achieve that, but with characters, I don't care. I don't care about. So that's, that's my only thing about that. But yeah. I, I formed a better co relationship with Caparzo, if that says anything. So, uh, just FYI. Yeah, Brian, go ahead. I will say, too, John Travolta's hard <laughs> in this movie. I, I, I don't know what he's trying to do or where he's coming from. Or, like, I feel like he was just trying to be MacArthur or something. It was just, like, ugh. It was very ugh. annoying. And he tells the guy, he's like, oh, you know, it's good to have older guys in this. And then he talks about, later on, the, the colonel, that he was at the point. And it was just very strange. You know, he's like a West Pointer. I, just, I didn't I, make any again sense, that that inner you know? monologue editing type style. It needs to you need to care about these actors for that to work. And the fact that it happened with every single other character, including dead people, 
it just felt more like I was high on shrooms more than I was fucking, you know, understanding what the fuck was going on. I'm sorry. It's like, it, you can be chaotic with your editing, but you have to have something that binds it together. And it just, to me, like, for example, uh, the combat sequences, mainly when they're, I guess, uh, like, demolish or, like, uh, wiping out all the wounded Japanese at the medical huts, I guess. Is that that whole sequence? That was a strange one, yeah. Continuity matters. Boom, there's fog. And then they're throwing fucking spears through fucking uh, fog. Because that's what the sound effects tell me. Not the bullets are whistling by me. That there's that there's that there's someone's tossing like tomahawks through fucking smoke. Like, that's all that was telling me. Like, things like... like this movie suffers from continuity with sound effects not being all the way same, with with sound not being there all the way, with with very, very, very jumpy, uncontinuity-like editing all the way around, and it suffers because you have no idea what the fuck is going on, and then when all that's done, you still don't know what the fuck is going on <laughs> because it's, it's trying to be emotional and deep. But, you know... That's my editor brain screaming at me as I watch this. But, um, yeah, my rant's over. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the Higgins boat's are really cool. And the troop ship, that was really, I think, a really interesting way to, to bring mm -hmm. it in. I can't think of a film where they have what was it, six or seven Higgins boats and fully loaded yeah. guys. You're headed, headed the, to the shore. The, they, I think they had one ship mm -hmm. because it was the same ship duplicated a bunch of times in the background. But the fact that they had a live ship is pretty freaking cool. I can't remember what the... I guess that's just a normal standard troop ship. Am I correct? It looks like a TAC transport or something. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that was super cool. Just like Wall Canal Diary, you know? <laughs> How the whole thing... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thing. Like, yeah. yeah Sorry. And talking about how long the film is, you know, I feel like they could have cut it to when the uh, sirens are going off, like, on the troop ship. Cut the whole beginning out, and that would have made sense. Like... It's two hours and 50 minutes of a runtime. And I feel like, Nate, you could take this film in its entirety, cut it to two hours, and it would make so much sense and be so oh, much yeah. better. Like, from the final product that they did. Oh, yeah. You know, and it's funny. Yeah. It needed two or three more passes of editing, but it just didn't Well, I, and, and then and then I will let someone else speak here. But uh, what the thing is, and the reason why I kind of mentioned before, is I think there's a different film in the editing room for, floor and or post-production uh, editing-like direction, <laughs> is that... There were characters that we had never met, yet were supposed to matter when they die. Like that kid. We see him one time, and then we're supposed to feel something. And he apparently has a has a relationship with actual Aiden Brody, actually, in this film. Not just another big nose Frenchman, but an actual Adrian Brody was in this film. He he we're supposed to he's supposed to have a like a relationship or or with with Adrian Brody, but we've never we've seen Adrian Brody sad face four times but he doesn't say a single line and this kid is dying yet we're supposed to have this relationship which makes just makes me think that there was so much cut from this film not to only just so it wasn't five hours long like i feel like this th this whole entire movie could have probably been made a series but that's this point series weren't a thing series were a downgrade in entertainment at this point in 98 so you know, I feel like this would benefit from something because it probably was so much footage and so much character development they probably cut just to be like you know art house. But you know, and I put quotation there, but for people obviously. But you know, it's like that. That's just how I feel about this whole entire film as a whole. It's like it just I feel like it suffers from a post production cut, and I think it suffers because. There was not enough time in the world for someone to watch this movie in its original foundation. I have no evidence of that. It's just what I believe with how things were cut and done. But uh, anyway, my ranting is officially, I'm, I'm hitting the chess clock. Someone else take over. So, Dave, the main action of this is uh, the battle for Galloping Horse Ridge, or Hill, if I'm getting that correctly. And um, do you want to just you know prime us through the actual battle? Yeah, so in James Jones, I'll, I'll take it back to James Jones. James Jones uh, enlisted in 1939 with the um, 25th Infantry Division, part of the 27th um, uh, Regiment. He was in 2nd Battalion. So he made a corporal. He was actually at um, Pearl Harbor at Schofield Barracks, and he was involved in that. And that's why his first uh, book is From Here to Eternity. 
and then the 1950 something film from here to eternity. Oh, so that's about. I didn't know you wrote that. Wow. Huh. Yeah, that was that's the pre-war. That's about the pre-war old army, so to speak, the regular army, and that was his, the pre-war in that. And then obviously the thin red line takes it on when the the 27th uh, regiment goes to combat in World War II. So yeah, he was a, a pre-war um, U.S. soldier. He was a corporal when we hit Guadalcanal. He was in uh, Elf Company, 2nd Battalion, 27th Regiment. All right, so the 27th was part of the 25th Division. It landed in Guadalcanal about mid, early to mid-December to officially relieve the 1st Marine Division. So their first uh, time in combat for the 27th was going to be on the, uh, the 10th of January. It kicks off an offensive. Uh, General Patch, who was the overall Army commander, decided he wanted to uh, eliminate the Japanese around the Mount Austin area. So the 25th was given the, the task of seizing the Galloping Horse Ridge, which is a series of ridges um, and hills around that area. And what they wanted to isolate the Gifu, and the Gifu was the area on top of Mount Austin that the Japanese had a major stronghold on. At that stage, the uh, 35th Regiment had surrounded the Gifu of the 25th Division. So they needed to isolate it because the Japanese were getting some reinforcements from the western side to go into the Gifu. So the, the 1st Battalion and the 3rd Battalion were given a task uh, to kick off to take those ridges. So if you go into um, my YouTube channel, the Guadalcanal Walk on the Battlefield, I've got a, a episode It's called uh, Captain Charles Davis's Medal of Honor in the Thin Red Line. And that's probably the most perfectly observed battlefield on Guadalcanal. So it, repli it, it, it takes the attack on the, uh, the, uh, of those two battalions up on that ridge. So the movie, even though the book uh, is, fic is a fiction book, um, it was based on an actual event. So if you read the book, you'll see that James Jones changed the names. Like, for example, the, the Galloping Horse Ridge is called the Dancing Elephant. Uh, Mount Austin is called another name, and he's changed the names of his obviously the commanders, but the action depicted in this movie follows the action of the 2nd Battalion of the 27th Regiment um, attack on the Galloping Horse Ridge. And then if you talk about, if you drill down deeper, Company F, which was James Jones's company, they do a flanking attack and they do a series of, uh, of other things. It's pictured in this movie that it actually happened in real life. They talk about the ledge. If you remember... Um, I think Nick Nolte's the, the lieutenant colonel, is pushing, pushing, pushing the captain to go attack, attack, attack. And, and at one stage, the captain says, sir, you, you know, you, you have to come up here. And he goes, I will come up there, and it better be as you reported. So he comes up there, and he goes to the ledge, and he talk about the ledge. When well, in actuality, there is a ledge. It's a giant coral ledge on the, on the side of, of Hill 53, which is a Japanese stronghold. They also mentioned in the movie, oh, we can't see the Japanese stronghold, and that's very correct too, because the Japanese had uh, reverse slope defenses. So they could, <clears throat> the area they were trying to take out was a, about three major bunkers. It was on a reverse slope, and you could only get it to be coming in from the west. So every time the, the, the guys in reality would come over that slope, they would get hit. So they had to, to flank it and go around it. And then the lieutenant colonel came up, and then he, um, the next day, they'd formed an attack, and they, he said, we'll move up to the ledge. And then John Cusack, in this show, is loosely based on Captain Charles Davis, who actually earned a Medal of Honor attacking those bunkers. And then the scene with John Cusack. That's what I like about this movie and the, the action scenes, this scene with, you're showing now. Mm -hmm. That's probably the most accurate. The only really part I really like about the whole movie was this part here, and they, they play it very well. I mean, yeah, this the, film, the, this... the the going through going up and through the grasses and the whole movement up before everything starts kicking off, just because uh, people can't see what we're seeing, but but oh, that's yeah. kind of yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So if you go, yes, yeah, the going through the grass. Now this part, even though I mentioned parts of it was filmed on Guadalcanal, this part here was filmed in Queensland in, in northern Australia. But the grass is is very uh, much like it is in reality. If you go into my uh, YouTube site, especially with the the Captain Davis episode, you'll see the kunai grass. It isn't this thick, and, and, and before in the actual battle, a lot of it had been burned off because they bombed it a bit, but the, the, 
the actual ridges are open just like this and they were attacking it looked to me this looks just like they did that very well it looks just like the terrain of Guadalcanal up on that ridge um, now John Cusack in the, in the actual uh, film is based on Charles Davis and it, when it shows when he earned his Medal of Honor they they gave Davis and four other guys a task of moving around the flank because Davis had been there the day before and there's a ridge called Sims Ridge he went up there with a, a lieutenant and another guy and, and lieutenant was killed Sims and Davis was calling in an 81 millimeter mortar fire on this reverse uh, slope position and, and he knew where it was so the next day the lieutenant colonel um, said this is where it be our plan. He took one company, which is E Company, up on that ledge, and he had Davis and four other guys coming on the west side, and they were supposed to distract the Japanese by throwing hand grenades. And then Davis was going to blow, blow a whistle, and then the whole company with Lieutenant Colonel was going to attack over the top of the ledge. But what happened in reality, which is loosely depicted here in this movie with John Cusack, they get there and they start throwing hand grenades, and then the Japanese threw hand grenades back, and John Cusack and his three guys, instead of drawing the attention, he attacks anyway, and he takes out the bunkers. Um, and he starts blowing his whistle. That was going to be the signal. And in, in, in the movie, Cusack blows his whistle. And then the rest of them come over the top uh, with the lieutenant colonel uh, leading them. So, yeah, so that, that was pretty much, that was fairly accurate in this, especially if you, if you know how it, um, it evolved. Um, yeah. So the um, you know it was uh, apart from the Colt forty five finger guns that uh, they they keep every every time they like like someone has to reload a, a carbine they pull out the forty fives and they just finger whip the forty five as they shoot like some kind of fucking boomerang <laughs> like I, I'm watching we have it up here and I forgot like the guy because they make a whole point of him taking a forty five so they got to make him shoot it but like I always loved Hollywood when they shoot they try to like flick the bullet with extra momentum as they fire it uh the, you know like <laughs> and really 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 quick just a quick question dave um carbines on guadalcanal oh yeah that's what was my next question yeah i forgot about that yeah no there was no carbines um used during the six month campaign there was no m1 carbines that was mm. one of the big fallacies about this movie i don't know who they got to do the um technical advisor but yeah that's this i've got the the list there you'll never see a photograph of during the campaign. Now later, um, after Guadalcanal became a major supply and training base, yeah, there were M1 carbines. I mean, you can find M1 carbine sure. bullets and stuff there, but not during the fight. The 25th didn't have them, and the Americal didn't have them. Um, they also didn't have flamethrowers. There's a scene in here they have a flamethrower. The only time they were flamethrowers were used in a six-month campaign was in January, and it was very well documented. When the 8th Marines uh, used it for the first time. 8th Marines and engineers brought one up and they used it, um, but uh, getting the bunkers and, and the Gifu, they didn't have flamethrowers. They wish they did, but yeah, that was, yeah. And, and, and one scene here, they're using flamethrowers, which is a we very weird scene. I think we discussed before when they going through that, the, the that, Japanese. That's Japanese that's, medical hunt, right? Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I mean, I think if we had, when we talked about Guadalcanal Diary, is that, you know, they were clearing out, they wish they had flamethrowers, because I know they were clearing out stuff with like, you know, gasoline barrels and TNT charges and satchel charges. I think we talked about that. On Tulagi, yeah, yeah, the caves yeah, they were yeah. fighting in. Yeah. So, uh, Brian, go ahead. Yeah, so just to touch on, you know, historical accuracy, it, it's strange they have carbines because they have yellow hand grenades. They have holly liners. I mean, they're not the best reproductions, but they try. I mean, they have first pattern HBTs. They really do, to a point, go the extra mile, you know? And I thought the Japanese looked great. I really... Like when you Japanese actually film. see them, um, you don't see them to the very end, yeah, or to the well, or to the medical well, part. I mean, sorry, it's funny because the beginning of the film, like during the battles and stuff, you only see like four or five at a time, and then it's like, oh, did they only have limited actors? And then the end of the film, you see like a platoon of them, and it, they look great as far as what I know for Japanese soldiers. And it's just very strange, like how did the carbines slip through? Because they really did try. Like somebody knew enough about holly liners and that stupid shit. So you know. It's just interesting. Was it an oversight or, and, and while we're on it too, I love the color of the Garand stocks and things because, you know, collectors and stuff today, 80 years after the war or 70 years after the war, everything is perfect in the same color. They didn't give a shit during the war. You had forearms that were different than stocks and vice versa and stuff. And I, I just really like that. It was just very, you know, 
mass production GI and just cool to see, just not polished, you know? But um, I think Dave, I watched your video after um, I watched this last night and uh, I was very surprised too how, you know, they got the Australian scenes that you'd mentioned to look like Wild Canal. But one thing you had mentioned in the um, video I want to talk to you about is, so you'd mentioned that they use depth charges against the Japanese positions um, on the Gifu. Was there any reason for that? They use or? them on, on this assault up Galloping Horse Ridge. Um, <clears throat> on Hill 52, uh, they, drew, they flew, I think, west to east uh, with um, the SBD dive bombers. They dropped the depth charges. In fact, there was a depth charge found not too long ago down in the water hole at the very base there. Oh, they just had them. They might as well, might as well use them. You can imagine the shock wave of a depth charge if it hits um, impact on land. And that's what they use. They said, well, we can drop two, 250-pound bombs or drop 100-pound bombs. Why don't we drop these depth charges on, on top of them? And it worked quite well. It shook them up, the reports were. Huh. Yes, I had never heard of that um, at all in, in, in combat, and I thought it was very interesting to touch on. You know, just uh, <laughs> maybe an improvised situation or something, but just uh, how? Yeah. How, when? When? Yeah. When? When? Right, you know? when if, if? If? I know this might be a little bit of a tough question, but if we were to try to describe those kind of death charges to people, because like what I think about when I when someone says a death charge, I just think about the classic Navy thing dropping a fucking iron barrel in the water and like that's all i think about for death charge but i know that's comically wrong what 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 normally would the, would those be like what were they finding like how big were they roughly you know just i'm just curious of trying to get things up a hill like that or or secretly trying to get something up a hill like that no they they dropped them off of a, a dive bomber Oh, I'm sorry. I, I misheard that. Okay. I was picturing Marines rolling <laughs> it up the hill or some no, fucking no. shit like that. Okay. Sorry. 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 I missed that part. Well, they couldn't get water. So, yeah. 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 No, yeah. Sorry. Okay. That makes much more sense. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, I'm here. Sorry I'm late, but uh, glad to finally be here. Uh, you, you, I mean, you miss, you're missing Viet, Vietnamese, uh, or Vietnamese, geez, Viet, Vietnam uh, uh, ripped sleeves two days in. So. You know, it's all good, man. Yeah. One thing um, that I also did like from the early battles, like by the Woody Harrelson scene, is the one guy that loses it. The guy like, comes down the hill. Um, you know, I, I, I yeah, I was gonna say that. I, I like how when uh, when they kind of realize what's going on, uh, you see uh, it's really brief, but you see John C. Riley grab his rifle from yeah, him. Yeah, I'm going. I'm going. Yeah. you know, nobody yeah. stops him. And I, I just, yeah. you know. It's not like what you usually see for like uh, a guy breaking down uh, that type of situation. I, I, I will say, and then uh, uh, I want to jump into more history stuff with Dave, is that the 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 thing is with that scene, though, unfortunately, is like I think there was more to that character, even more. Again, it comes down to who the fuck is this and why does it matter? <laughs> because <laughs> because there's so much because there's so much going on and there's so much juxtapo juxtaposition cuts back and forth to him up to him sitting down to saying we're all dirt to this stuff to that stuff so to me i get again this movie suffers from a lot of that kind of like i feel like it's all kind of moshed together to make something at the end of it i i wish i was here for the beginning discussion because uh that's kind of the, the my, my whole thing with this movie because this movie was you know apparently they filmed just an insane amount of footage i think it was almost an entire year worth of shooting and um they had a five-hour cut when they first filmed it or when they first edited it and it i think it took them seven months to edit too they said and uh they had seven a five-hour cut and then they had to condense it even more so it's like and it completely got changed in multiple cuts and stuff like that so yeah the movie it's it feels very discombobulated and not uh not fully focused on what it's all about and who is who and and, and all that stuff that's my main problem with it yeah no I, I, you're you're pretty much uh echoing our, our grievances throughout earlier is that and you filled in a the gap there which is i assumed it was a post-production direction you know how do we make 20 hours into three into yeah. a very long, <laughs> into a very long three, I will say. Well, and, but, and, yeah. and like you, yeah, even watching this, you could easily still cut forty five minutes out of this thing. Yeah, you know? say, yeah. Honestly, honestly, you could probably do like an hour, an hour and fifty, to be brutally honest. I mean, I, I wish that like we, you know, we could like somehow obtain the footage and do our own cut of it because the movie does have like really good stuff in it that I like, um, moments in it that I like, and little aspects that I like. I think are really good, but. Uh, yeah, and then it has a bunch of stuff that I really don't like. Right. Um, 
Uh, Brian, you lead. So, yeah. So, Dave, after, you know, the fight for the Gifu and for uh, Galloping Horse Ridge, so in the film, they, like, go into this medical camp and stuff. What did the 27th end up doing after this battle? And in the, specifically James Jones, what happened to him? Well, James Jones was wounded in the, uh, I think he got shrapnel on the ankle. So he was evacuated um, after this this fight. So he, he was actually he was actually wounded in the, um, the I think the first day. No, because what happened was his battalion was in reserve. So the third battalion was the guys in, in the lead. They went up. It's a good study on um, train appreciation and how lack of water will, will stop a unit in its tracks. Because they went up, they ran out of water. And then the next, and they didn't get water resupply either. And then they started their attack the next day. And a few Japanese mortar and machine guns just stopped them. And then the second battalion, which is Jones' battalion, moved up and relieved them. And then they, they fought, they fought, and they, they stayed another night. And they almost didn't um, make it either because of lack of water. And I think early in the morning, a big rainstorm came, and it, it quenched their thirst enough to, to push through. So once they, they took it, they consolidated on the ridge. And then a, a couple of days later, they pushed out and, um, and, and took another ridge. This whole scene about the Japanese camps and overrunning them, I think that was just a bit of um, artistic license. One, the only time in the Guadalcanal campaign we've seen a number of Japanese surrendering, more than four or five at a time, was at the very end um, in the Cape Esperance. And there's some famous photos of there's about six or seven Japanese. It looked very like that, much like that camp, but that was at the very end in, in February and when they're mopping them up. But, I don't think they took any prisoners at this stage, especially at the galloping horse. Not that many, I, I can guarantee it. And they weren't sitting around and the Japanese were laughing and, and throwing things at them like that. You know, the Japanese would have threw anything at them, they would have shot them out of hand. <laughs> and they would have killed most of the Japanese. And the Japanese would have killed themselves, or the other Japanese would have killed them. Or if the Japanese even tried to surrender in some cases, they would have just shot them out of hand too. Yeah, it was just very odd, especially how the American guys there being like, you're going to get eaten, you know, that vulture is going to get you. And it was, you know. Well, there's a lot off. of shit like that in the movie. Uh, like, I, I don't know what the fuck 90% of the, like, narration meant. What uh, what, what anyone was saying and stuff like that. That uh, that part, uh, I, I don't really like narration to begin with, but that part of the film is like, I, cut that shit it, out. I don't it, like it's, that. It's not, it's, it's not normally it wouldn't be my forte but i believe it is very powerful but you but it is very random uh i i would disagree with it it doesn't need to be in there and that it's not warranted i think it's very warranted i think it's very deep i think if you look at the context of the scenes and do stuff however the problems with those scenes i feel like they are very random and they're very un I, I, maybe, maybe the word random is the key word there. It's, it's very, very just out of nowhere, right in that moment, what the hell's going on. No, not that it doesn't feel earned. It, it just, it's just, there's no lead up. There's no, this moment normally leads up to this inner monologue or this, or there's a conflict that leads up to the inner monologue. Like there's a shot of a dead uh, Japanese, I guess, boy in the dirt and he has the inner monologue. So like, you know, it, it, again, it's, I think it's, I think it just, it's so uh, random in its sense that that's where the problem is. I personally find with it, but I do feel like they are very powerful when you, when you contextualize it, but it takes you, you're pulled out of the film to try to contextualize those moments. And then it's like, I don't want to have to really overthink what the fuck is going on here. I think that's the main problem I have with those scenes. Um, See, that, but, yeah, yeah, I am. Um, okay, okay, go ahead. Dave. Well, yeah. Yeah. Oh. So do you get where the, the title comes from? Do you know the origin from the title? Of I the do thin not. Red line? Isn't that like the, the, it's the, from the a line poem, of the map, right? right? Or well, it's, from it's from a poem, poem isn't it, or it, something? Well, like, yeah. Yeah. the thin red line, some people think, oh, the thin red line's from, you know, the Balaclava in the, in, in the Crimea War. That is a thin red line. But then the thread line, red line, he says in the book, and I wrote it down, there's only a thin red line between the sane and the mad. So I think in this, in the book, James Jones is trying to show, and maybe that's what Malik's doing here, that the, there's a thin red line between the sane and the mad. Maybe that's his, his whole thing. If you, you, you think along those lines, a lot of this kind of makes sense about you, how it's so disjointed and throws everywhere and it's all over the place, kind of like apocalypse now. 
Um, now, James Jones was discharged from the U.S. Army. He was busted down, went going AWOL a number of times, and he, he, got a, he, um, he went out for psych illness because um, from his, his uh, wounds he received and his mental. So he got an he got a honorable discharge, but he was, he was busted down a number of times for AWOL. So that's why I think you see AWOL in this movie with, with Wit, who the main, kind of, I guess you could say, the main character. And also the whole thing about the whole mental aspects behind it. Um, maybe Jones, this was part of his uh, recuperation through his mental um, attitude or mental um, situation he went through toward the end of the war because he was discharged in 44 um, from a mental illness. Just to touch on that, so that was something that after I watched it, I really thought about. Um, my grandfather fought in the Pacific. He was in the Coast Guard. And he always used to say that we won the war, but we lost the peace. And, you know, looking back at the war and the greatest generation, or whatever, you know, you want to call them, that those guys, like, you know, they, we view them as, you know, heroes. They did this thing and whatever, but they were just kids. You know, they were thrust into these positions that they didn't want to be in, and they had to make decisions that they never thought they'd have to make. And they had to live with that. And, you know, we put them on a podium, but I think it's really easy for people to forget that they're just kids at the end of the day, you know, and that this was incredibly traumatic. And I feel like the film is almost trying to be like, you know, the peace was ripped away from these guys. You know, they grew up in the 20s and the 30s, a, a time where it was bad with the depression and stuff, but it, it should have been a time after the, the war to end all wars was over. And it should have been a new world. But then they were thrust into these crazy places like New Guinea or, you know, Tunisia or wherever. And they had to deal with this. So it's really the psyche of that generation of, you know, having the, these four years of horrible conflict, you know, and what it really meant, not the 80 years after the fact, like, oh, grandpa was wherever, like, you know, they, they were just kids. So in that vein, you know, Dave, maybe that's it. The, again, the thin red line of sanity versus, uh, you know, not sanity, like just, how far can you push it and still be the same? Um, that's interesting. I had a, uh, how I felt about this movie um, was that what it was saying and all that was uh, that, you know, it's, it's, it's all about nature. You know, it's showing the, the beauty and the terror of nature, you know, and that basically war is part of nature. It's part of human nature at the end of the day. And uh, you know, that both, the 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 beautiful part of nature which is what we see you know in the beginning and and all that stuff and then the horror of nature which is what we see like in this scene right here um so that's kind of what i gathered from the overall message of the whole thing sure you know and, and a line came up in a memoir i'm reading recently about a combat correspondent and again he talks about how lush and how beautiful the pacific is you know and, and just like we're making war in like this beautiful place you know and like you said they do touch that in the film and they do shoot at Guadalcanal and, and, you know, Guadalcanal is this crazy, you know, rainforest jungle. Just it's got a lot of beauty to it. Turquoise waters. and th I mean, Dave, you've been there. Um, I think you, you lived there for a few years. Um, you, you know, it just it, it really is beautiful outside of a context of a war. But then thrown into, the, you know, you're doing these crazy things and this beautiful place. It's just such a juxtaposition. I think about Tarawa. You know, that place could have been a friggin' resort, you know, in a, in a different timeline. But no, a thousand Marines were killed, you know, there. And it's just, yeah, it's just crazy juxtaposition. It's a lot different than Europe, you know. I mean, like, for example, Italy, you know, you're fighting in a museum. It's just, it's just a different type of, uh, of horror, that is. So it's just a very, again, it just doesn't know what it wants to be, this film. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah that's 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 the main problem with it it just feels very very murky and muddled and not really sharply focused on what what it's all about but even though like that's what i say at the end of the day that's kind of what i got from it that it's all about nature and that even though like we see nature as beautiful but that, that, that war, war is, is also part of, part of nature yep so i'm just i'm just i know the the listeners can't can't see this but i'm just seeing some of the films you show when they part of the movement they're going through the Japanese hospital or village and it's just it's it's almost want to laugh about it because you know you got Japanese running out and they're doing you know punching them and pushing them down and Japanese are getting yelling at them and they're just ignoring them none of this really happened 
The only, the only reports I've ever seen with second raiders on the long patrol, they came across a whole Japanese hospital, and the majority of those Japanese couldn't move out of the bed, and they, they end up stab or um, bandit most of them. Well, they killed every one of them, but end up they didn't capture any prisoners. Um, they all the raiders said they don't take prisoners. And they would like in this show here, if this would have been the Marine raiders, and they would have killed every one of them. Um, and there was no scenes where they mass. This is like 30, I'm looking at 30 or 40 Japanese here, and then they running through, and they, they would have killed, they would have killed most of these Japanese, raw to hand, because they couldn't, they couldn't really trust them, as you know, that the whole um, aspect of the, the, the Pacific War at that stage, they would, in, in these scenes here, they would, they would have shot every one of those Japanese. There's no, there's no direction in the scene, this yeah, is what, they're this all is, over this the place. Is, this yeah. is what really, really frustrated me about this whole entire thing, it's like, I understand what they're tra again it, i think it comes down to the the film doesn't know what to be they have so much they're they're going in all different directions and they're going well let's use this and let's use that and let's use this let's use that like there's a scene here that i remembered in my notes though and i took that there's a one japanese prisoner that you see that they interact with and he's reacting in about three uh, almost three to five different times with the same motions and they show all five different times and it's for me. I feel like it's like they didn't know what to do, so they want to showcase compassion. They want to showcase, you know, uh, 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 hostility, inhumanity, humanity. But they want to do it all at once to show how chaotic it is and have every single aspect of every different prisoner. You know, that guy just went from crying to madness. You know, like like just little things like that. And and then you have a guy praying in the middle of the fucking courtyard yeah so like uh i th yeah, yeah so so i think what it's trying to kind of show is that how like the how, how the japanese the whole thing about like being you know disgraced if they surrender and all that shit i think that's like showing how like maybe uh just in despair they are that they've lost i think maybe that's maybe what they're trying to show with this no i was, I was gonna say but you interrupted me but i appreciate it i'm sorry Nick. <laughs> <laughs> fuck man like come on okay i'll just i'll just be no, quiet just raise now. your sorry. hand <laughs> Okay. That's all I'm asking. Touching a scene you mentioned earlier, Nate. Um, I did like the Dear John scene. I know it seemed like out of place and stuff, but I did like the words and how. No, like, no, I, was. I have. I help have, me leave. Help me leave you. I, like, I, I have no, I have no problem with the Dear John there. Just, just stop fucking skin touching her twenty five times. <laughs> like I. Okay, I get it. She's a she's a woman of Rohan. Okay, stop fucking touching her right now. All right, I don't need to see it a million times. Like that's my only quandary of it. <laughs> um, no, no, it's it's it, no, it, no, no. I I like I I think I think it's also important because it's a psyche. It's it's a different level of psyche in the film that is like you know quintessentially like if uh, the home front quotation marks. But you know we don't need to see you know, how they do laundry in 1940s either. So, you know, it's like, just call back to We Were Soldiers. Um, I was just going to say that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no, I mean, like, you know, uh, all in all, I mean, like, you know, again, I think this film just doesn't quite know what it wants to do. Um, in terms of, um, I, I was I was curious to know, uh, I, I guess from Dave, is like, how long this is this is from someone who i don't know a lot of specific theater stuff my my area for teens is mainly european theater d-day on um in terms of how, how long were they on i know we talked about it in, in when we talked about guadalcanal diary no we probably went over but how long i guess was the army on guadalcanal versus the marines i mean obviously the marines were there first correct i mean like or were they around the same time because if i remember correctly wasn't it the pacific like the pacific tv show that shows that the army gets there later Yes, the, the Marines landed on the 7th of August, um, and there were the expectations that they were going to land. They were going to be there for two or three weeks because they were the premier assault troops, and the Army were going to come in garrison. That didn't turn out to be due to a number of reasons. The first Army unit to land was a 164th uh, Regiment. They landed on the 13th of October, so almost, almost three months, or yeah, two months, a little over two months. Um, but they were the 164 for the first U.S. Army unit to go on the offensive World War II. Now, the majority of the armies, that was a part of the Miracle Division at the time. So they're the first regiment to land, and the second regiment of the Miracle uh, landed 
in late about mid mid November, which was the 182nd, and then the 132nd landed in uh, the first week in December, and then about mid December, like I think you said earlier, the 25th Infantry Division. Uh, they were supposed to go elsewhere, but they were re-diverted uh, to go to Guadalcanal to relieve the 1st Marine Division. And then the 147th U.S. Army Regiment landed. So in actuality, there were more U.S. Army on Guadalcanal than Marines in the end of it. The whole 2nd Marine Division fought on Guadalcanal, too. So you had two whole Marine Divisions fighting. And, and two and a half, well, yeah, two, yeah about two and a half, including the um, independent artillery battalions in the army, about two and a half army divisions there. I know that a lot of uh, National Guard units that end up on um, Guadalcanal, like the 164th and stuff. Um, and the, there's a really good memoir um, across the Dark Islands. I forget which unit he's in, but I believe he takes part in the Gifu action, um, whatever. But I know he talks a lot about like the divide between the National Guard units and the infantry units, the, the main line and, and them. And how like the, the mainline guys really didn't trust the National Guard guys in a lot of cases. Yeah, he was in the 161st. The 161st was the, um, the 3rd Regiment of the 25th Infantry Division. They were the National Guard. The other two regiments, the 35th and the 27th, were regular army. So yeah, and, and there's a lot of animosity um, in that. In fact, the first actions here, the, the 35th went to the Gifu and the 27th went to Galloping Horse, and they put the 161st in reserve, the National Guard guys, because they said they didn't, they didn't raid them uh, initially. And then they gave them a supporting road, and obviously they, they worked out that these guys can fight too. So, yeah, you can understand, you know, the regulars and the National Guard. You know, probably uh, Mike knows a bit about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We'd have to go a little bit, we'd have to go a little bit, um, a little bit west to do Guinea for that around the same time, but... Oh, is oh that- for Buna? Buna Gona? Yeah, well, well, yeah, the 32nd was getting mauled in New Guinea, and Guadalcanal Ugh. pops up, and, hey, we're God. taking the islands. New New Guinea, that that would be a, duh, God. Yep, the Ugh. islands down Ugh. the mountains, yep. Wet socks. Ugh. Unfortunate forgotten campaign as well, because there's not really a lot about it in uh, movies or anything. I, I was about so, to ask, there's no movies really about that, is there? No, well, about Buna. Anecdotal, like um, <clears throat> there was a, a thing that I read a while back about a, a Marine that was on the canal and they were asking him some shit. And he's like, yeah, you know, it's it, it wasn't great. It was a tough time. He's like, I'm just glad I wasn't on New Guinea. <laughs> 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 and um, yeah, it's. Uh, yeah. But anyway, yeah. So a lot of the National Guard stuff was. What? Yeah. Um, these, you know, sorry, sorry, Mike. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. I was just going to say, like, a lot of the National Guard were underrated, even though they had performed well in the First World War. But they were, at the beginning of the war, they were underrated. But they were also the most equipped troops because they were always on maneuvers. They always had the newest shit. And they were good units. So that's why a lot of them were deployed, especially to the South Pacific, very early on. And they were the first units, the first Army units in combat before Operation Torch even took place, whatever, with the first ID and everything like that. Um in the Pacific, yeah, the, the 32nd, um, yeah, the 25th, the Americal at that point, um, they were all some of the first army units in combat in the South 41st. Pacific. Yeah, 41st, yep, yep. The, the um, uh, so I know the patch, what the hell is the name? But um, yeah, the 41st, uh, and then um, the 37th later on, like all those units, those National Guard units, uh, were in the Pacific. And that's a very forgotten chapter because the Marines actually get the uh, credit for the South Pacific. And that's just the way the history is as far as like average people are concerned is the Marines won the South Pacific and blah, blah, blah. But we know more and that's how we're kind of talking about it. So, yeah, you know, well, that's because the Navy has the best PR department in the world. <laughs> so, yep. you know, it's uh, Marines, Marines, Marines. Oh, and these guys are there, too. Now the narrative is kind of changing. There's been a lot of good books that have come out about it. Um, yes. You know, in the last five years, I'd say, you mm-hmm. know, really people start to know. But, um, yeah, like, like for example, the 164th. I mean, didn't they land the day of the naval bombardment um, where the Japanese blew the shit out of the island and the airfield with, like, uh, battleships and everything? Yeah, the not the the Barbara, the, the not of the battleships. That was their welcome to Guadalcanal. So that's when they <laughs> got the fourteen-inch rounds. 
It was like the first yeah, first day they were there, or first night. It's like uh, in Die Hard, welcome to the party, pal. <laughs> you know, it's like the fun, you know. Nate? Um, real real quick, um, Dave, have you ever seen the movie Kokoda? It's the Australian. Where, where is that based? I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, PNG. It's, it's the same. It's a Papua New Guinea. It's the Kokoda. Papua is like the, the southwestern uh, part of New Guinea, and that was where the uh, the fight over the Owen Stanley uh, Mountains, yeah. the Kokoda Track, and that was from Bunangona yeah. was up north. They were the two villages up north. The Japanese had landed, and they were fighting over the Kokoda Track to take Port Moresby. And then that, that depicts uh, the early days with the two militia battalions that went up, and then the, the U.S. Army uh, came in later, and they went around, um, tried to go... There's a good book called Ghost Mountain Boys, and they tried to go around where well, the Australians going over the top. And then they, they both ended up in, in the, the twin villages of, of Buna and Gona and to eliminate the, the Japanese there. Yeah, it was that New Guinea was Guadalcanal sucked from everything that has been recorded and everything. But New Guinea, for whatever reason, was forgotten about, and New Guinea was. Uh, here's the flamethrower. Scene. There's your like, flamethrower scene, Dave. Yeah. But um, it's an early flamethrower, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. New you Guinea, though, as far as like, um, because uh, obviously there's a lot of pictures, a lot of photographic evidence of the 32nd with Aussies, and they were fighting because the Aussies said, "Hey, man, they're here. Like one more jump, and uh, they're going to hit Australia." And it was insane. The amount, like the really, so the 128th Infantry Regiment of the 32nd division at that point was the first regiment to be airlifted into combat not parachute but like airlifted into combat and then the 127th were told to go over the owen stanley mountain ridge in hbt's and a lot of them froze to death because they were like oh you're you're in a jungle environment here's hbt's here's your uniform go over these mountains go to that ridge you're going to link up with the 128th when you go over there and a lot of them froze to death Nobody knows about that either, which is interesting. God. So. It's a tropical yeah. thing and you freeze. Ugh. Yep. Yeah. You guys sweating all the time and, you know, uh, equatorial rainforests and half of them had malaria. And then, okay, go fly over these mountains. And it's just fascinating because the Owen Stanleys play a really big part in the early part of the war. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, you might know more about this, Dave, but. The reason the Port Moresby was so important was because it was the only Allied airfield that was within range of Rabaul, where it could be attacked. And that's why we really had to hang on to that eastern bit of uh, Papua New Guinea, because, you know, without that, then the Japanese just basically, you know, we can bomb Solomons, but we can't bomb Rabaul, which is the most important part of their South Pacific infrastructure. And, you know, Battle of the Coral Sea takes place there. Uh, as Mike was saying, you know, the Owen Stanley mountain or the, uh, the Dakota trail and everything, like it was just such a very important part of the war that unfortunately people really don't know about or study. And on top of all this, it's very interesting because the war starts in December of 41, the Australian army is fighting Rommel in North Africa. So the only troops that they really had to send to Papua New Guinea were these conscripts that were part of the national guard, if I'm correct for Australia, it's of a different name. But they were all like, you know, young kids. And they basically had to change the definition of, you know, defense of the country so they could send these troops to Papua New Guinea. So, like, you actually have these, you know, American National Guard troops fighting with a very similar force from Australia. You know, so it's interesting. They're all not the main line army in a way. So it's, yeah, the New Guinea campaign is very fascinating. And then Guadalcanal kicks off and that's got all the headlines because, like you said, the Navy's got the best PR department in the military. Yep. And again, you know, they were building airfields and, you know, another airfield that could bomb Port Morsley was horrible. <laughs> it was, it was yes. like worst case scenario, you know, but it's fascinating how these one group of mountains, you know, in New Guinea really do affect the whole course of the war. Because early in the war, when they want to bomb Rabaul, uh, they have to fly around them because not all, you know, they, they had a PBY mission early in the war. Where they couldn't, you know, fly over the mountains. So they had to fly around them and think of how much longer that is, you know, and it's just, it's just, the topography and just the geography of the South Pacific just played so heavily into the campaigns that you really don't get it until you get, you know, balls deep. Well, and a lot of the, a lot of these early campaigns like New Guinea and, and, and the Solomon islands, very close together geographically, like they're very close. And they're also close to Australia. And it's like, it's, it's a few hundred miles really 
And it sounds like a lot, but it's not with the modern technology and everything that everybody had. So it's like each campaign, each, each little shithole Island, like Guadalcanal or, 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 or um, um, Cape Glouser or, you know, New Guinea, they all have a very important role in, you know, like you said, the, the lines, the, 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 uh, the, the lines of um, goods flowing back and forth, the strategic lines of like, okay, they can bomb Australia from New Guinea. They can bomb Australia from Guadalcanal if they really wanted to. So we have to like, we have to, we have to clear these islands out that are not that far apart, but like, it seems like a world apart when you're actually on that, like in the thin red line, it looks like you're in this magical world. Like you were saying earlier, Brian, it's like, I'm from Oklahoma and now I'm here. It, you know, it's just like this, this, you're completely worlds apart, even though you're on the same planet and you don't really know why you're there strategically fighting, <clears throat> but it has to be done. And then later on, you might find out if you survive. Oh, okay. Well, they're building airfields here. They could hit this and that, and that strategy. But, um, yeah, it's, um, it's very interesting. The, uh, the, the this scene, <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> And just to throw the last wrench in the mix, there's only so many islands that lay perfectly within the trade winds where you can right. build an airfield because you can't build an airfield everywhere. I mean, especially at the time, you know, propellers and stuff. I mean, so that's why the battles in the Pacific could only happen in very specific places because there's only so many places that you can, you know, build this infrastructure. So it's just crazy, you know, it's just when you really think about it, all the logistics to go into it, like, yeah, there's a reason the Marines didn't get supplied for a few weeks. You know, we didn't have a Navy and they were so far away. Like it just makes everything understandable. So <laughs> why would yeah, <laughs> just, just really quick. And then I'll let you guys go like do your tangents, but this happens so many times in this film. Why the fuck are you walking upstream the most noisily possible way when you're literally 10 feet away from the fucking banks of the river or the Creek or whatever, where you're going to make a lot less noise. Why are we doing this in this film? Because cinematically it looks amazing. <sighs> <laughs> that, and they also shoot a uh, mouse from the matrix. That's why he, he floats downstream. So. <laughs> oh shit. That is. That yeah, yeah. 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 Um, no, like uh, my, Mike, I agree with you. It is the most, it's the loudest thing you can do. Oh my God. It's yeah. the most inefficient. Like, <laughs> yeah, let's go way steep in water upstream to go make contact with the enemy and we're going to be in great shape. You know, we're not going to be winded or anything or wet or beat down. Like, yeah, it's just the way we do things as an infantryman. Like let's go up a fucking body of water. It, that's moving against us. Yes. It, yes. It, I, I would, I would think that for a production standpoint, you're not having to deal with uh, trees or brush. You can have everything out there in the set in the open. And then it's sure. also very nicely, Frame cinematography wise to have the yes. Japs all in leaves coming out. All, all, all in unison, like very, very close, is, clumped up together. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It, I mean, it is a very, I, I, when I said this, this film is beautiful. That is one of the shots that always co did come to my mind. That shot is actually very beautiful, whether it's realistic, <laughs> probably not, but it's very yeah. beautiful. It's very pretty okay. and it gets the point across. It's pretty. But, yeah. yeah. All right. I'll say this too before I forget. Um, so growing up, I used to love Medal of Honor Pacific Salt. And this film came out like six years before that. And I totally see the influence. Like the the influence you mean the ripoff? Uh, literally, yeah. Like it's yeah. funny, you know, where things are. So that's what I made the correlation this time watching it. Like, holy shit. Now I want to play the game again. But like, <laughs> it, it's just, it's interesting, you know? It, um, but, uh, uh, I, I will, uh, I, I will throw out some numbers here. Uh, and I think it's, it's relevant. Um, I looked it up that, uh, Saving Private Ryan came out in July of 98. This came out in December of 98. Oh. Uh, Saving Private Ryan made $485 million in its box office. This made 90. <laughs> so there was quite a difference. But I, I but I think but I think the budget was completely different. I I'll have to double check, but the budget was 70 million for uh, Saving Private Ryan and this was 52. Well, this movie was also this movie was in development much longer than Saving Private Ryan. Um, it was it was uh, they started like writing it in the eighties, and uh, and then like the the production went into full swing like in nineteen ninety 
four, I think. So it, it was it, it was a, a much longer thing than Saving Private Ryan. So it's if this had come out before Saving Private Ryan, it would be interesting to see if maybe this would have, I don't know, gotten more like attention at the time. I'm not sure. Maybe it got more attention because of Saving Private Ryan, but maybe it didn't get rewatched or get the buzz because it wasn't Saving Private Ryan. Like like what like what came first, the chicken or the egg? Like it's kind of like. Well, how about this? How about maybe not? That's not a question. Maybe what hindered it? The fact that it wasn't Saving Private Ryan, or the fact that it, you know it it just wasn't the caliber people were looking for. Little an- crazy, little guys. anecdote before I have to go take a pee. Um, <laughs> I remember being a kid and wanting Pokemon cards in the local grocery st- or whatever grocery store we had in town. Now they had VHS tapes, right? They had. Uh-huh. Saving Private Ryan, The Thin Red Line, blah, blah, blah. Everything in 1998 that was in 1999 that was like really popular. The Thin Red Line was always in stock. Saving Private Ryan was always sold out and whatever else. <laughs> and I remember, and it was like, huh. I didn't know at the time. Of course, I'm a kid and I'm like, well, I don't know what The Thin Red Line is. I didn't see it till much later. But like now I understand why a bit. Yeah. Also, the fact that it was on two VHS tapes. Correct. Yeah, it was, it was a double stack. Yeah, like Patton or like yeah, Pat- yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And yeah, it was on two, and then Saving Private Ryan was on one. You know, with the dramatic poster and everything on the front. Wasn't um, uh, wasn't Gangs of New York like on like five? Or I don't. Four, like I don't remember. Four, yeah, I remember Titanic was on four. Yeah, I think I think Gangs of New York was four. Think or five. It was, was some. Rid- it was, yeah, yeah, it was some ridiculous. Thing. I remember the Titanic one was. It had the poster on. It was gold sleeves. too. On it was gold. yeah, it, it was, was gold. gold. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. And then I remember. Uh, I don't remember seeing Private Ryan, but I remember. Uh, well, Seymour Ryan had the gold version too. With um, two. It was um, it was two VHS tapes within. It was so it was uh, the actual movie itself, and then the like. Director's cut, the, the yeah, scenes yeah, on, yeah, yeah, of. yeah, yeah, and it was like people bought the shit out of those, and you know, yeah, my grandpa had it. Yep, it, and it, it was, there was yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm, gonna go take a, I'm gonna go take a, yeah, take a piss. Yeah, go, 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 pee. Yep. Yeah, I just love those Japanese. Sorry, they look so good. Yeah, like, hmm. I agree. They did a good job there. Yeah, like there's nothing else to compare to it. Sorry. Uh, no, no, no. Go, go, so go, go on this rant while it's on the screen. It's fine. No, it's so cool, and because the Japanese are really big with camouflage and things, like you know, they did have nets. And another interesting thing is that, you know, the Japanese, you know, military, wherever, wherever they touched, you know, in the Second World War, they influenced the revolutionary movements of these other nations. So like if you look at a lot of like um, uh, Viet Cong or North Vietnamese army um, tactics and stuff, they have a lot of the same camouflage tactics and things that they got from either guys that fought in the Japanese military or fought against them. And it's all around the Pacific Rim that you get these influences, you know, not just in Indochina and like. Borneo and the other insurgencies of the fifties and sixties. So it's just very interesting, you know, to see where it began and it began, you know, in the, the Japanese occupation of all these nations. And, uh, but I really do think like they have carbines, whatever, but the Japanese, Holy shit. And it's not just like, Oh, one platoon or, or whatever. The type 99 machine guns are great. They have type 92 um, woodpeckers, you know, like it's not Thompson stuck in Vickers mounts. Like we see in Guadalcanal diary. You know, it's just, they just look amazing. And they, ah, it just, they do such a good job. I mean, in the Pacific, they have Japanese. They do an okay job. But the Thin Red Line Japanese, I think, hands down, are the best in any modern or even, you know, post-45 cinema. It, they just look so good. They act good. They, besides the POW scenes, whatever you want to say with that. But when you have armed Japanese soldiers fighting in this film, they just look amazing. And I just really want to shout that out. I mean, they're probably not starving like they were on the actual island because it was nicknamed Starvation Island. But just, they look so good. Very and, very yeah. fresh troops, though. Look at them. Very fresh. Yeah, right? Mm-hmm. Just off the uh, Tokyo Express. <laughs> Creases on those uniforms. <laughs> right? The thing in, in the Pacific I feel like that you don't see is that you don't see the Japanese up close in the beginning. So the Guadalcanal... Uh, uh, the whatever that that episode is with the rain with the island Pavuvu, the one that rains all the time. They you, you see them all in the dark and, and stuff like that. Yeah, like like you see them far away, but you don't get up close, intimate scenes like you do in this. And I think that's I yeah. think that's probably what you're commenting on, Brian Moore. Well, than anything you get a little well. bit 
in the sequence that were John Bassalone and his whole gun section. Um, you get a little bit of Japanese. Now you gotta feel the fire. <laughs> that's more like yelling and like, ah, like you know, very quick. Right, it's yeah. not like this where it's long shots and they, they just look so good. Yeah, you know. Yeah, no, so they, they give the... them time on screen to look really good. Yeah, so we're was talking about the Japanese gonna... soldiers. <clears throat> what were you gonna ask us all, Nate? Oh, the, well, the yeah, there's a uh, there's a uh, there's a piece of equipment here. Also, I'm still mad at the guy who didn't shoot the lead machine gunner on the ridge of the hill. Shoot the guy in the front carrying the fucking wheelbarrow thing. Not shoot the guy in the back. Come on. I, I did like his line, though. I just killed a man. Nobody can touch me. Yeah. You know, well, you know that was interesting. So. Yeah, those, those inner monologues, when they worked, they worked. When they didn't, they were like, what? Yeah, I didn't hate all of them. Yeah. I'm just saying a lot of them, I'm just like, okay. I, I can also, some of them, they're like whispering. I can't hear what the hell they're saying. Mm. Turn your volume up. I do. Well, the bird <laughs> um, there's a point also where... It felt like there was no sound and they were reacting to stuff or sound was wrong. Like, there were some weird edit. edit. Again, weird editing things as an editor I was picking up. I was like, what am I? What? Uh, it's right around here. I'm just trying to find it. Uh, Did they have support from the Australian Army? Because I swear to God, some of those guys are wearing, like, Australian Army giggle caps or whatever. Like, especially the artillery scene. Those guys definitely okay. look more awesome. Yeah, they, might have, they might have had some extras. I don't know. Mm-hmm. That, that thing right there. there. What, are, what, are, what are these? Ammo tubes. Don't know. For for what? Artillery ammunition tubes for mortars or whatever. For mortar, mortar. that's eighty one millimeter. Ammo tube. Uh, that's, okay. that's called clover leaves. They fit on their packing tubes, mm -hmm. cardboard packing tubes. You had the triangle looking clover leaves. They're mm -hmm. the end caps. So you yeah, just it's, had, it's six rounds, right? It's six I, rounds. I, Okay. Um, they look like from there. It looks like it's probably eighty ones. I would say. Yeah, yeah but were, six rounds. Stuck, you know, they, one, two, yeah. three, four, five, six. Yeah. Yeah, they were stuck yeah. down in those. You twist it like this, and you pull it out. I never. Yeah, I've never them seen them. Fire. I've I've seen them separate. I've never seen them together in that clover bracket before. Oh, on Guadalcanal, okay. um, especially if you go into my videos and stuff on my, my my Facebook, I got everywhere you go in Guadalcanal. There's clover leaves everywhere. Okay. okay. That would make obviously sense. Obviously, the cardboard's it, the cardboard's been deteriorated because they used to use them to right. cook, make fires with. But yeah, the metal metal bits are still there. So they're like so. Just to paint a picture for my own my own brain, they're they're metal end ca end caps that you see on the end there, and those are the cardboard tubes all throughout the middle. So you're finding all of the the cart the the metal end caps that they would just rip off. Okay. okay. And they also had um, uh, aluminum uh, little ends. Two of them, it said what they were. It was 60 millimeter, 81, and it has the, the lot number and right. all the stuff to them. You find a I, lot of those too. I, I, I got, I, I, um, my unit runs in 81, but we only have, we only have the separate, you know, tubes. We don't have the, the, the clover end caps. I've never seen those. I've always had just the tubes that have the rounds in them, but I've never seen them elongated like that as like a man carrying, you know, like a pack. Like I, I figured they were ammo of some kind. I thought they were bazooka rounds, honestly, but, uh, but like not not a launcher, but the actual rounds. I know I'm not yeah, the, that naive to think they would be a launcher. The <laughs> round, commando, yeah, the it's rounds, not commando. Yeah, the rounds would be uh, for bazooka. or put in a bag three. Okay, mm -hmm. that's or, what I figured. So, yeah, in yeah. cardboard case. Yeah, because I because because I know mm -hmm. I know for us for a bazooka team we carry them in the bag, but I didn't know for storage if those were like just the way that they transported them and then you empty them out and put them in the bag. But yeah, that's no, that makes sense. Totally that makes sense. While while we're on the scene, I had a question for Dave. Um, so when they're at the Henderson Airfield area, um, which is looks okay, I saw a P thirty nine Air Cobra, and I was wondering some good if they were ever on Guadalcanal. Oh. I know the Cactus Air Force had. Oh, they oh, did. They did so. so yeah, later, later. So was it an army unit, or because I know that they were used at Midway, but yeah. So so they had the P P thirty nines a bit later. I think they replaced some of the P four hundreds. The P four hundreds were there originally. And that's another thing I was going to mention there. They showed the airfield, and it had a F-4F, which a Wildcat had a uh, dive bomber, had a Dauntless dive bomber, and had a P-39, which I thought was was a good little um, addition to the movie. You'll see there's a you're showing it in now. There's P-39s in the background. I don't. I, it's hard to tell if they're P-400s. Probably for the movie, there's probably P-39s. Maybe they meant to to make them look like P-400s, but they did have P-39s later. But initially, it was the, the 67th Squadron. Um, they were the first U.S. Army units to answer your question. They landed there August 23rd. Their whole fighter squadron of U.S. Army Air Force. So U.S. Army Air Force was there from the beginning. 
So it, it shows, at one stage it shows the F4F, I mean, I don't know if this scene, the next scene, but then in, then it shows the dog bomber um, puttering down the airstrip and they're chasing them or something in a truck drinking whiskey or something like that, if I remember. Oh, yeah, that's a good yeah. Um, uh, I think they're I think they're painted up T6 Texans, if I remember correctly. Yeah. But they do a really good job with the blue. Oh, really? The, you yeah, know, I, I, I you can't surprised. really tell, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then when they land too, they have I think another Texan like flying parallel to the beach, which is kind of strange, like you know packing the shot, I guess. And that's another thing I meant to mention at the very beginning. It shows them landing and then they they hit the beach like they're going to be fighting, but that didn't happen in reality. I mean, the twenty fifth landed you know, administrative wise. Same with all the army when they landed there, they just offloaded. There was no resistance to any beaches. The Marines landed there on the seventh of August, and but I don't know why they they had to. Um, Made it, I guess, make it look better to them to land under fire, which in reality they just landed administratively, carrying their duffel yeah, bags I mean, with them when they come off the ships. Well, because in reality, how big was the whole perimeter of Guadalcanal? It wasn't, I mean, the biggest thing in the world. And most of the units, I think, came in through uh, Lunga Point. Point. Yeah, it was about was, 15 was miles, but they all came in roughly Lunga Point. That was all admin, admin area around the airfield. Mm-hmm. It's just like in the in the Pacific series when you see them landing, and the Marines are stealing from the army. That's how, in reality, how it was. They just landed carrying big duffel bags over the shoulder. <laughs> well, I think the joke was, and they talk about it in the show, was that they didn't know that the Japs only bombed the airfield and not you know the beaches and everything. So that's why the army guys didn't know what was going on. I know Lucky talks a lot about that in his memoirs. He got some funny anecdotes. That's why you steal moccasins from a captain. So <laughs> I totally forgot George Clooney was major. <laughs> uh, yeah, for like, and he has like a he has like a top title card too. And he's only in well, it for like thirty seconds. Well, that's how you, so, that's how you get the film. How long it was in originally? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, mm-hmm. Well, there were there were there were big time actors that were cut completely out of the movie. Like mm-hmm. Bill Pullman was cut out of the movie. Mickey Rourke was completely cut out of the movie. Yeah. Um, God, who else? Uh, there was there was a couple other ones. Um, let me look it up right here. But you know the you know the reason why so many big actors wanted to play in this movie. Oh, it's because oh, uh, yeah, it's because of uh, Malik, because Terrence Malik. This was like his big comeback to uh, cinema. Yeah, yeah. they're all just asking for cameo bits. They're all you know, standing in line. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, Bill Pullman. Yeah. Mickey Rourke. Lucas Haas was in it. Um, uh, who else? Uh, Viggo Mortensen. Um, oh wow. There were a mm. number of actors that were like sprinkled throughout it and they got completely cut out of the movie. I love this shot. I think I mentioned earlier. Really. So many Higgins boats. It's like Conneaut, but not Conneaut. <laughs> Everyone loves a good Higgins boat scene. And dude, like this many? They're not digital. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, it's this awesome. This many in, in a fuck. Pacific theater shot. One, two, too. three, yeah. four, five, six. Like, I think there are six running in the States now, throughout the States. Like, you know. So, a little question for you, Brian. Um, I noticed the amount of Holly Liners, and you brought it up earlier. Were they all going to be Holly Liners at this point? I believe so, because if you look at the supply lines of how the 27th got there, and the early high pressure and low pressures didn't weren't made until, I believe, September or October of 42. And if you do the general rule of thumb, it's six months until something gets yep. anywhere. And that's based off usually serial numbers. If you look at serial numbers of tanks and Jeeps, usually six months after their DODs. To say delivery to the army, right? So, gen, you know, you basically after the the canal, when you probably would see the lows and the high pressure liners showing up. So, you know, the canal was really a, a holly liner only event, which is you know <laughs> interesting. And they do a good job of getting the yeah. No, 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 I get that. But like, um, yeah, I was just wondering because like it's all, and I didn't. I'm not quite sure about that. So yeah, like I mean, yeah. I'm not questioning it, but I, I, I personally just don't know about that. So yeah, interesting. Yeah. So yeah, when you look at photos, and there's a lot of famous photos taken um, of them on like Mount Austin and stuff. There's one famous guy, one of a guy like kneeling, and he's holding his grand like at a perpendicular, <clears> like a 45 degree angle with a 16 inch bayonet. He's got a big holly on his liners back. Um, yeah, no, they did a good job. And also, I think we'll run into IMDb quick or FTB quick. We'll talk about it. But if you look at a lot of the grands, the gas cylinders are silver, and that's correct because the very early grands. The way that they treated those gas cylinders was very bad. And I think they were stainless steel and the bluing didn't stick. And um, they would wore off and be silver. And that even comes up in accounts. There's this very good um, publication from the Marine Corps in 1943 called Fighting on Guadalcanal, 
where they basically interviewed a bunch of Army and Guadalcanal vet- Marine veterans about their fighting Guadalcanal to get, you know, information about the next campaigns and what they learned and worked and didn't. And one of the comments in there that I love, because I have one of these early Garands, was one of the Army guys said that, you got to change the Garands, they shine too much. The ends are really bright. And, you know, that was a problem that they talk about. So it was really cool to see that, you know, maybe they planned it, maybe they didn't. But the ends of the Garands are very silver. And that, if you look at photos, that's totally correct. So with that, I want to ask you um, again, the, uh, what I call the plus sign, like the second pattern um, gas plugs for the end of the fucking. Yeah. Yes. Guadalcanal, they would have had the single slot, correct? Yes, because the 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 Phillips head style didn't come out until I believe late forty three three yeah. because that they were sense, used yeah. for the grenade launcher. Yes, because basically you couldn't use the M seven, I think, early on because of the slotted plug. You had to take the plug out. Sure, that was a big issue. The reason they did that was because they didn't want guys to fucking mix live and blank ammunition. Yeah, because that would be a big problem. So they made it so they didn't, and they realized that was really stupid. So they changed it later on. For example, another early war thing that was stupid they changed is that every single Jeep had a key at the beginning of the war. Mm. You lose the key, you're screwed. And they didn't change that until mid-43, or it was just a switch you could change. So again, you know, we had to learn these little things. But yeah, the early war, it would be slotted. Yeah, so they got that wrong along with the carbines. Yeah, and well, that's a very hard thing to, you know. And then, and then so, so Dave, uh, at this point, um, with the Army, the 27th Regiment and everything, um, how many how BRs many would they have per platoon? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, they, <clears throat> I was looking for some BARs in the film, and there's one or two I noticed, especially towards We're the not end. correct that I noticed, but like... Um, yeah, I'd say, I think they had one per squad, one for infantry okay. squad. That's what they rated, and the same was the Marines. So if you, you're watching something here, I was going to say, I didn't want to uh, interrupt Captain no, Davis you're good. here. <laughs> Um, you if, can always interrupt me, Dave. No, Brian, it's all right. <laughs> you if, can interrupt Yeah, right in there, that's actually on Guadalcanal. They're filming mm-hmm. this. This is seen on Guadalcanal. Anytime you see the natives in any of these shots, that's actually Guadalcanal. Okay. So that's okay. that. That's a Guadalcanal, and I know where they filmed this at. Um, so let's see how the grass is there. Mm-hmm. That's the actual grass on Guadalcanal. That's what Kunai grass mm-hmm. is. And you see some people is refer it? to it. You're right. It is, th- it it is thinner than Australia. Australia. It is thinner. You're correct. Right. Yeah. Isn't and, it razor sharp too? I've no. Heard no. Oh, really? And, oh, okay. No. If you grabbed it and you pulled it very quick on your hands, it might cut you. But you can just, mm-hmm. did you notice when they're going through it, it just yeah. is very soft. It's, it's very it's hot. Swamp, it's soon, swamp grass. It's yeah, swamp grass. As soon as you grass. step in it, the gr- it probably goes up two or three degrees, mm-hmm. especially with the high stuff. I mean, there's scenes in here where they're actually on Guadalcanal, and that's, that's a Guadalcanal, and that's actually the grass of Guadalcanal. Then if you go back to the scenes where they're charging the bunkers, you'll see mm-hmm. the grass is a bit different. So that's, yeah. that's Australia. But that's kunai grass. That's Australian or um, Guadalcanal kunai grass right there. And then there's hills. This is in the northeastern part of Guadalcanal. They filmed them um, not actually on the battlefields, but this is toward Cape Esperance. So, but the Japanese, this would have been part of the, um, the mopping up campaign area during the actual campaign when the the U.S. Army and the Marines were moving through to, to clear the northwest part before the Japanese evacuated. So this is around that area. Hmm. Brian, were we... In that mang- sorry, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I said in the mangroves they walked through before this, like that swap. Was that also filmed on the Guadalcanal? Canal? No, I, I think that's Queensland. Because um, no, I know where the area they filmed around um, when they did go to Guadalcanal. I think they were only on Guadalcanal for probably two weeks. And then mm-hmm. due to logistic reasons and a number of other reasons, mainly money... Uh, they filmed in, in uh, they filmed bits of it in in Guadalcanal and the most majority of it in Australia. I don't think the actors were loving. Um, I think Nick Nolte and the rest of them were loving Guadalcanal that much. I was I was told from some of the locals. Too hard, too too hard for them. And it shows them. It shows a part there. They're they're marching up a hill, and in the background you see uh, Savo Island, and that's that's a very good scene. They were marching up there. I think it's one of the very beginnings when they're marching that, up. That was- that was one thing I noticed from when you're on the actual battlefield in your video that you know, how prominent Sabo is. And like, it literally looks like you can touch it. You know, I mean, it's 20 miles away, I believe, but like, it's just, it's incredible how clear and close well, it is. Almost. You know? Yeah, but there's right a there. scene in here where they're marching up a, a ridge. Oh, here it is. That's Sabo. Yep, Stop there. See it? Yep. That's Sabo yeah, Island. Yeah. And this this area here is a place called Benigi, and it's one of the 
good diving spots of the Japanese transport there. Um, and they, they dive there. And up on this ridge, this is where the 6th Marine Division had their camps, 1944 and 45. And the U.S. 6th Marine Division was, was born on Guadalcanal. And they had all their camps down to the, to the right near the main road. And up on this ridge, I walked on this ridge. And on the other side is a big dump, big garbage dump, the camp garbage dumps. And that's where the locals used to get the Coke bottles and the Pepsi bottles to sell to the white fellas, I said, the tourists. And I, I, they used to show the dumps, and you could see the, the 6th Marine Division, they would drive up, and they would just take their big trucks and just dump all the camp garbage down in there. And I've got photos of it. You're just walking in there. It's just stuff everywhere on top of the ground. And I know some guys that's been, had been um, in that area been, um, had dug up some of the 6th Marine um, dumps too, and they just put all their gear in, um, in 50-gallon drums and just buried them. And some of the stuff that's come up through the years is almost in mint condition. But that's where this is. And you can see, like you said, there you can see Sabo in the background there. That's definitely Guadalcanal. That's what, how it looks. Real, real quick, uh, Dave, uh, on, on, a, on a question about... Um, Brian and I got on a talking point about uh, diseases, mainly bug pathogens and stuff like that and i think brian had said something about guacanal being a, a really bad part especially about some brian refresh memory some some bug scrub that's in typhus? grass or scrub typhus, scrub typhus in grass yeah. mainly i'm or not sure how much that was in guacanal but that was that was a big thing in new guinea okay. like good enough island and stuff with, with, um but dave could touch on that yeah, yeah scrub typhus is is mainly new guinea i know um um i know some australian veterans here had got scrub typhus uh scrub typhus the worst thing in Guadalcanal is obviously the malaria and dengue fever. They're the two, two uh, worst things um, you get there still to this day. The dengue fever is a mosquito you get during the day, and, and the malaria is one you get at night. So jumping into it, this is something for you, Mike B. So did you notice the one uh, Farb for the helmets? I'll pull up by MFTB here. Not the Holly liners, but something that was on them. Pause for dramatic. No, effects. I didn't look that close. <laughs> the medics, they have subdued crosses. Oh, yeah. Way in the South Pacific? No Especially way. in the Pacific. No way. Yeah, no way. No fucking so way. I, I, I saw that. And I know, that, I know that they're trying to like be like, oh. It's the, uh, no. the medics, but that's not Japanese did not, not give two shits or a flying fuck about that. Well, 
it's funny because in um oh what is it flags of our fathers or is it uh the other one let uh, us they say it in both they, they talk about it in they both. Talk about, okay because they have the one scene where like they point out like look for the cross and it's yeah like, that's not a thing. no no it's just you it's know? just like you know it's not going to do any good so why the fuck would you put that on your helmet exactly yeah like you why know, would you love- yeah and a lot of times you had covers or things and your helmet's so dark with the rain and stuff anyway that you, you could barely well, see Well, exactly. It's just it's just extra effort that's not necessary. So, yeah. Yep. And the <clears> other <throat> thing I wanted to bring up too um, was uh, how dirty they got. I really liked how dirty the uniforms got. But it, it was, it was excessive a, though. Like the sweat stains and shit, like it's not going to be black. Like your your tanks are not going to be black. I like. I, I will. I, I will argue the sweat stain as a man who has already sweated through his shirt in the last two hours. Yeah, but the shirt was dyed black. It wasn't made black <laughs> from your sweat. The shirt was originally. Black. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I just like how dark they get so quickly because it shows how I'm a slimy boy. It is. Yeah. And there was a little difference between the guys in the front and the colonel and stuff, like the artillery guys, which I like too. But it might be too much excessive, but I did like the effort. I, I'll say that. Well, I'll tell you what I don't like is I don't like a man already transforming to f- fucking Nom. In two days, I said it before, I think I've said it three times now. I blink, I blink, yeah. and he Hulk ripped his bicep sleeves off. I was, and- uh, I, I noticed that this, because I've seen this before, but I really noticed, like, oh, that, that sleeveless, uh, guy yeah you know, the, the muscle man with the with the bar i think yeah. that is cyclops <laughs> from the x-men movies the original in the early 2000s he's tall enough yeah i think that's who that is but <laughs> and, and the last thing or not cyclops really... fuck the dude with all metal sorry but I, I, I my my fucking iron nerd. giant no <laughs> fucking steel with shaquille uh, o'neal <laughs> no <laughs> no um kazam this is kazam <laughs> <laughs> I Shaq food. liked. I really liked the chicken winging at times because that again, that's what you do with a high powerful rifle, you know, compared to today. But some of the exaggerated fucking you know, like you know Warning. recoils were really bad. Obvious. Yeah. Oh yeah, there was some that was like, ooh, ooh. it was like oh, oh you, shit, are you talking you about know? the guy who goes like yeah, was, like, <laughs> like with the pistol, the finger pistol. You, you, know? you saw what like, I was like, doing right when Dave was talking. I was trying not to distract him, but I was going like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, was funny. like you know, flicking the pistol makes mm-hmm. everything. Switching to your better. pistol is always faster than reloading. Yeah. Fucking, yeah. <laughs> okay, M1. Okay, Garantham. So, but, so uh, this, okay, so, so so real quick, does anyone know who this guy is? Because it was He's bothering a, me. He was he was uh, John Connor in Terminator Three. That's why it was yeah. bothering me. Okay, thank you. Yeah, he's yeah. also the little bastard guy in uh, Sin City. Yellow bastard. Mm-hmm. You were not long. Yeah, yellow bastard. Okay, I, yeah. I didn't know that IMFDB had this. Whoever used guns and what? That's interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. The, if you um, click on the actors, it shows all the movies that they. Um, that they what was G forty one M? What was uh? Oh shit. Oh. Oh. <laughs> what? Jim Caviezel in. Passion of the Christ to <laughs> crucify this. <laughs> I didn't know that was Jim Caviezel until this I is the movie that launched his. Yeah, career. Yeah, I had no idea that was Jim Caviezel. Oh. So yeah, yeah. Uh, so, Jesus himself. Just to preface it, so yeah, guys, we're gonna head over to IMFDB and take a look at some of the guns used in the movie. And uh, we're on the M1 behold, already. Yeah, so the M1 caliber thirty grand. Who would have guessed? <laughs> With mostly the wrong gun sights, uh, but I love the wood though. Oh my god, I, I really like that. The mismatch and everything. Brian loves the wood. On the Garands. <laughs> <laughs> Don't clip that. <laughs> <laughs> These guns did not come out of uh, somebody's collection. Yeah, no you know? lock bar on that. There was an early flush nut pinion sight, um, but they do look a little different. These are the T105. Lock bar sights before. would be what, 43? No, forty two. late 42. Or, or, or early 42, actually, because the flush nuts suck dick. So. I thought that's who that was. That's the Punisher. That's the first Punisher. Oh shit! Yeah. Oh wow! Yeah. Is that, did the Japanese kill his family? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> that's the scene, Brian. You're talking about uh, with the bad uh, recoiling. Oh no, yeah. Or yeah. emphasizing recoiling. Uh, I love the bayonets, though. It's cool to see 16 inch bayonets. You know. Oh, and I hated the so, fucking cartridge belt over the shoulder. Well, I was going to ask that, like, because he has a regular cartridge belt on, then he has that one over his shoulder, like a bandolier. What is it, Battlefield 1? Yeah, no. it's it's very, like, uh, steampunk, diesel punkish. 
I mean, there's like maybe one or two situations that justify. I've seen one or two. I've seen one or two pitchers in the field like that, but again, it's like reenactorism when something is like, like, yeah. We have a guy that's wounded, and we're bringing him back, and I put his web gear over my shoulder. That's that's the situation that it would make. I also didn't. I I was trying to find a way to sneak in with Dave, but I couldn't find an opening. Was. uh, <laughs> we now know why how Jim, uh, J- or Jared Leto's jaw is so squared. It's because he chews gum like that. <laughs> My God, that ma- yeah, like I'm not, 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 not. Fucking like, yeah, let's, yeah, yeah. And then he gets wiped yeah. out in like what two point five seconds. Like oh, he was probably originally the star of the movie. So yeah. <laughs> got to piss no, uh, Adrian Brody was actually the Adrian Brody was supposed to be like the heart of the movie, but. And when he went to the premiere, he was so pissed that he has like five lines in the movie. Oh, he did a Christopher Lee and a Lord of yeah. the Rings. <laughs> He's like, I was the star of this and I'm completely cut out. Well, yeah, the M1 carbine that we had mentioned was never used in the Guadalcanal campaign. John Cusack but they did, also kind of just disappeared. But they didn't have uh they didn't have bayonet lugs. Yeah, they did. On the ship they did go up. Uh the first one, Bam! yeah. Right there. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. then they have the other ones are but right. the rest of them are right. right. Yeah, <clears throat> highwood peep sites. Yeah, there's a few scenes where someone's running with a Thompson, then they're running with the same guy's running with an M1, and then the same guy's running with an M- a Thompson again, and then the same guy's <laughs> running with a carbine, and then he runs with a, a same guy. Cut it's Jim Caviezel, cut to cut to cut. He's switching weapons well, every other cut. It's amazing. Yeah, the so, funny thing is, is that Terrence Malick shot this movie where he would shoot a scene and then he would finish the scene like weeks later. And uh, so there's a lot of inconsistencies with weather and uh, stuff like that. That would so make that sense with some scenes. of the smoking, the smoke scenes. Right. That I, it was right before you got on, Mike, was uh, that was something I was. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this about. fucking, yeah. especially I this. Didn't even, I don't remember that. Wow. That's a deleted scene. That's Mickey Rourke. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. This is the, he was completely cut from the movie. Huh. I love the A1 snipers. Oh. Huh. Retarded fucking building. rifles. You nerdles. Not well, they're basically drill rifles that they turned into sniper rifles. Yeah, it's like that National giant National. ass optic. Yeah, it's really combat effective. Good shit. They they use them all the way into Korea though, with like, you know, affection. Well, they started throwing them on bigger weapons though. That's what's funny. Is like Yeah, but I mean yeah. but the A1s though, they they did they, there's a bunch of photos of them at Inchon. <laughs> like, you know, right. It's, it's it was just like they, they just the US can never oh my god, the US is so bad at like well, this is not a good thing. Well, we spent the money. We have all these in our fucking supply. We're going to issue them out. They're going to have to use them. <laughs> and, well, and while we're on the subject, the fact that this scope fucking shows up in Saving Private Ryan is so annoying. Uh, oh, the, isn't that the it's the bell tower scene, right? The quick yeah. change. Yeah, like, like, yeah, everything's zeroed. We're good to go. It's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? No. Just- Where's my borsite? Yeah, he's got, <laughs> he's got an ITO 3A4, and it's like, yeah, I'm just going to change out this optic so I can shoot farther at this 100-yard distance between me and the fucking bell tower sniper. What a fucking it joke. Was writ- it was written in the script. They, they There was no turning back at that point. <laughs> they, they're correct. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love seeing the 28s, though. Nice. I, with 20-round 20 uh, 20 round mags, too. Yeah, no, no, no. So go up, yeah. Yeah, so they have the 30-rounder there and, like, oh, yeah. Yeah, John C. Raleigh has a twenty. It's a twenty. Right well, they were only twenties at that I, point. Like, yeah, it's. I know that's a cool detail. Yeah, actually, no. absolutely. Yep. Mm-hmm. The patent date for the thirty rounders was June, December seventh, nineteen forty one. So they actually were being made. They didn't show up in big numbers on the canal until later on, but mm-hmm. you know they actually were in production. Right. You see them okay. in but what's stuff, funny so. is like, so ab- absolutely like they got it correct. It was mostly twenties in this film. Oh yeah. And yeah, uh, it's like they they got this. They got a bunch of other details correct, but like. Stupid shit. It's like, what are you doing? <laughs> by a thousand cuts, yeah. you know? But, and, uh, <laughs> no, it's good that, 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 yeah, in regards to the 20 round mags, because, like, that's one thing I know in the Pacific, they fucked that up. Like, they have 30 round yeah. mags. And that, yeah. yeah, from from the beginning. And then I'll just say this, and then you can go, I can't see John C. Riley not as Dr. Stephen Brule. So, like, <laughs> it was really hard for me. Like, again, he's great. He's a great actor and everything. But, like, the whole time, I was just thinking about, you know, his role is that character on, you know, Tim and Eric's uh, awesome show. And it's like, oh, my God, it's just fucking hysterical. You know, this is why Dr. Stephen Brule is like Dr. Stephen Brule. He, he does both great comedy and drama, dude. John C. Riley is awesome. Oh, it's amazing. It's depth. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I had a real quick story. I had a buddy of mine that used to work at weddings and uh, he was working a wedding 
and the guy who's the groom who's getting married was good friends with John C. Riley. And John C. Riley couldn't go, but he sent a video, like a you know, a videotape of him as Stephen Brule, being like, "Hey, uh, happy for your wedding, you know, good time, good time," you know, <laughs> like like a whole five minute like stand up thing for it. So you know, his range is amazing, but yeah. this is really funny to watch this and such a serious role and everything, and then just think about twenty years from now, <laughs> I know what you became, and it's just, it's just great. Uh, well, I was going to say, as he's going through that whole emotional scene in the tent, I'm just like, all I'm picturing is, if you put your nuts on my drum set, I'm going to stab <laughs> you in the neck with a knife. <laughs> There's a line that Meanwhile, comes out. Yeah. That man's like, an Oscar winner. <laughs> <laughs> They're sucking me dry. I'm dry. <laughs> uh, oh, my God. But, he mostly did serious films back in the 90s. It wasn't until, like, yeah. the 2000s that he started doing comedies. Well, it's also weird Carol. seeing him in Gangs in New York, too. He's the, he's oh, he was good in that. He was right? amazing yeah. at that. Yeah. 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 Listen, I don't give a tuppity fuck about you, Mark Conundrum, you meathead shit sack. Is he the one who says that? <laughs> no, it's the butcher oh. that says that, but to oh, okay, him, yeah. and he just, yeah. he's looking at him like. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Trey wants to be on a Civil War movie for this. <laughs> he hangs in New York. Yeah. And set there in the Civil yeah, War. Yeah, <laughs> he could do it. Yeah. <laughs> a little, um, a little 50 cows. So, yeah, 50 cows. <laughs> Okay, so this BAR, like, in the actual movie, like, go down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep, it's the A3. <laughs> You're right. There's going to be no bipod or fucking carry handle, handle, handle on that handle, bitch. Yeah. The bipod's right. No, nothing wrong with the, the bipod's. Bi- the bipod's fine. It's the carry yeah. handle. I think it's carry handle's totally wrong. But but they're also going to have a bipod in that environment? They're new guys, yeah. I mean, they came issue with them. I mean, yeah, I know what you mean, Mike. They would get rid of the fucking thing yeah. as soon as they could because it's stupid. But it's not necessarily wrong. <clears throat> I mean, you know, but the carry handle is totally fucking no wrong. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How's Inchon? You know, like fucking A. Right. Okay. I, and again, like, <laughs> the cinematography is great for some of these scenes. Oh, he doesn't he carry a shotgun too? Yeah. He's got two he does. Yeah, he's got 1897 and he's like the Hulk yeah. and then, yeah. Yeah. He's sh- way overdone. So the, I was going to, before we get, I mean, I know the grenades are a thing. I'm just, but like. The yellow grenades in this, they seem like they're covered in like a grease or something like that. Would they do that to like just get rid of the yellow or something? They're just worn. It's too. It's just it's worn. Too, okay. Yeah, they're, they're they are a little strange. They're like, dirtying them up. I think is what you're because most photos I've seen of them, they're pretty like they're bright. bright. Yeah, like they're, they're bright. Yeah. yeah. Think about it. You don't carry like reenactors get this wrong all the time because they buy one hand grenade in 2007 when they start reenacting. They carry it until they stop whenever. Or they lose it in like, the leaves in 2.5 yeah. seconds, which is yeah. what happens. <laughs> it, ordinance is not carried for long periods of time. If you have a grenade for a week, that's a long period. Of, that's like yep. an eternity to be carrying a piece of ordinance. Same thing with like Panzerfaust and shit like that. Like it should be perfect. It should be really new because you're going to eventually, you know, it's going to blow up and like whenever you're going to use it. So yeah, having worn things like that, it's not really correct. Maybe a smoke grenade you can get away with because you not, don't have an application for it. But like hand grenade, you know, you want to, you're going to get rid of that or you're going to pull the pin like Woody Harrell. <laughs> But, um, Jesus oh God! <laughs> it's the dumbest getting, thing. getting your ass blown off—that was something that, <laughs> dude. The, these yeah. fucking yeah, a, a grenade goes so, off your ass, dude. He would have been toast. He been he would have been split in half. <laughs> <laughs> right. oh, it looked just fine to me. So so now that we're on the subject of uh, shotguns and stuff, so it's very interesting. Shotguns are way overseen in movies and media from the Pacific. And the real reason that, you know, shotguns in reality weren't really used is because they mostly had paper cartridges. In the First World War, they had brass cartridges and they were great because they're awesome. But then in the middle, in the 30s, they switched to paper cartridges and there was still mm, some brass floating that's... around in the circulations. But the, what happened was is that they talked about how in these humid climates, the paper would swell and you wouldn't be able to chamber rounds and you would break the... Um, you basically wouldn't be able to use it. And this comes up again in that Fighting on Guadalcanal um, book where the guys talked about, like, you know, you can't use these. Counter it, Mike. Now, Counter later, it, Mike, when, you're done, when he's done. Because I'm watching your face. Like, <laughs> like Cape Gloucester, they got brass um, cartridges. And they had 10 or 20,000 of them, I know, when they went in. Chesty Puller was very adamant about that. He wanted shotguns with rounds that would work. But in the early part of the campaigns, I mean, they, you couldn't use them. It was just a problem of supply counter might be <laughs> i saw your face <laughs> that whole paper card or cardboard cartridge thing was a first world war problem it was addressed way before the second world war and they said yeah we can't deal with 
the swelling, blah, blah. Like they use brass cartridges and they were like, hmm, it's expensive, but it works. So that was something that happened way before the Second World War. They also were eating World War One rations on Guadalcanal. So again, the Marines and the supply lines are different, but that is the reason that comes out of the South Pacific is that they had swelling problems in the, just the early stages. Maybe it was some shit that was left at Pearl. Who knows? But this is what people talk about. And you do find a lot of 97s and stuff on the canal. Dave, a few months ago, put it on his page that some guy found one, Rusty Gold or whatever, and it was a 97 with no wood. So they were there, but just they weren't used. Right. Just like in the First World War, they weren't used as much as everybody thinks they were because Mm -hmm. it's a very, very, very mission-specific tool. And they're not that great. Like, the way this guy is using it in this film is like, yeah, that's my combat weapon. I'm going to go out and, you know, everybody else is an M1 or a Thompson or whatever, and I'm going to go out there with an 1897. No. No. It's like, if you mo- most shotguns that were actually used in the first and second world war were used by MPs guarding prisoners. That that's the reality of it. Like that's, that's really what it was like. They were used in combat for sure, but in such small numbers, like the whole thing they're trying to portray here is like in video games, even before video games, which is, I'll give them credit for that is shooting the Japs out of the trees, you know, like, and then this thing being like a fucking end all weapon against bunkers and whatnot, you know, bam, a bunch of buckshot. No, that's not how they were used, you know? And yes, I'm sure several times, you know, in the Pacific guys shot. Yeah. Like he's doing right there. Um, snipers out of the tree with a shotgun because whatever, or you can't miss if you aim in the direction. Well, you have to aim. I'm sure that happened, but like, it's still like, it's nowhere near, you know, this guy right here would probably not be carrying an 1897 or a shotgun in general on a combat mission. Um, I like how they, they kind of depicted this, the shotgun in uh, the Pacific where they're the machine gun crew. They're like, they're loading the gun. And during there's a, there's a charge and he grabs it like, and then, and then shoots him and then throws it back down. Like he like had to use it for a second or something. Well, like that's that, still you know? not, it, it, it's weird because again, it was a, um, it was a weapon that was drawn for a specific purpose. Like you had to actually sign a hand receipt. Well, world war one, but not world war two. Sure. But why would, why as a machine gun position, would you have a shotgun right there? Well, that's a different story, but I mean that the world war one application of a shotgun is different than the second world war. It was more of a personal weapon. You have like an MP or something. You didn't have to sign them out. You know, I, I know what you're talking right, about. Right, but there also weren't a lot yeah, of shotguns in the Second World War. Exactly. Like, that's the thing is, like, yeah. if it was there, maybe. But, like, this guy going out there with, you know, his whole Vietnam, <laughs> Vietnam gear, his loadout. Look, um, look he's double slinged. Like, he's, like, he's right. like commando. He looks more strapped than fucking Arnold. And so go down, go down to that next picture, right? So he's got a BAR belt on. Yeah. and. Because he, because he's holding the B, he has the BAR as well. Right, right, yeah. yeah he has the BAR and a fucking shotgun. Yeah, no way. <laughs> I, I really wonder. See, I got you pushed too many pencils. I really wonder if the tune had an influence on this character because he literally looks like the the shotgun bunny. Guy the tune. Like, no, well, not look, but like his mannerisms and stuff. Yeah, well, that's like, the thing is, like, I wonder if that you get the shotgun. It's a crazy it. dude, and he just inflicts yeah. all his damage. It's like, well, I mean, a shotgun. Yeah, it's a very it's fairly American, but like, really? I mean, that's, that, that's, that's just my whole like thing with it is like, yeah, they're used. They're still used. Like I carried one in Iraq. Right. So it's not like I'm saying they don't exist and like nobody ever carries one, but like the amount of them that are portrayed in like these hardcore roles and like, you know, whatever it's like, eh. And there's only a handful of pictures. There's one from Terror, I think, of the guy with a Model 10. Yeah. Uh, Remington Model 10 jumping off of a, of a Amtrak with a grenade vest on. And there's a few other ones. but um, Yeah, it's few and far between. Yeah. They, they exist, absolutely. Oh, yeah. But, like, it, it's like video games and, and well, especially think, video games. I, I'm, pulling, I'm pulling up the scene that frustrates me with him. It's this scene right here. Yeah. Because he, he, they're trying not to, like, He's blow. also shooting left-handed, which is not, that. that's. Yeah, that's the way I shoot. A few characters yeah. do, yeah. Yeah, that's. <laughs> it, they're trying to do it. They're trying to do it safely, but it's yeah. It's... Yeah, it's. He's trying to laugh. That's his problem. 
Yeah, see, he's like he kind of reminds me of Animal from. Uh, what? Yeah, he, yeah, he's yeah. Animal and Bunny yeah. all mixed into one, and it's like, oh, fuck it, I got the the short sleeves. It's like a flak vest, but it's not because it's HPTs. But like, oh, fucking, yeah. yeah, look at me, I got a BAR belt on because I'm badass. <laughs> fucking Christ, yeah. I stand out. <laughs> How many shotgun shells can fit in this? Oh. Well, 1911. So let, let's go down to this fucking thing because Nate was entirely correct. And again, what the, it's so, it's not even Hollywood. It's like retarded Hollywood. It's like, we're going with, with two extra chromosomes in Hollywood <laughs> of like, Hey, wow. My M1 rifles out of ammo. I'm just gonna willy nilly. Cause everybody's got a 1911 a one pull this out and go with unlimited ammo. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna aim, but I'm gonna hit every target I'm shooting at because I have a pistol out. Don't forget to flick. And, and con- don't forget to flick. To- Flicking makes it go faster. <laughs> yeah. Contrary to popular belief, at the time, um, it was only one world war that this gun had won. So, yeah, but you know, now it yet to be two. Now it's how many wars? Two. Oh, Look God, at the hat. fucking hat. <laughs> two <laughs> world wars. <laughs> Another deleted scene. Yeah, huh. deleted scene. He shoots it in the air while they're in the uh, are these in the water. Did what? he say there was a Can't... firefight? Did he say there was a firefight <laughs> while he was doing that? They actually got the grenades right, which I'll hey, I'll give them credit for. They look good. They looked they really look good. good. Yep, because Except for their strange color. Yep, the fuse right. was yeah. correct. The the shape, the body, like everything. Okay. Except for that, that that was stupid. Like <laughs> this part is ridiculous. It's supposed to be so like tragic and dramatic. I blew my yeah. ass up. It's like no, you and the guys <laughs> around you would be toast. A grenade is a very yeah. powerful little thing. If you watch it in slow motion, the charge actually like is inside his pants. You can see. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. It blows and, out. Up yeah, and out. yeah, it blows out. Yeah, it's like yeah. where's the? I thought. Well, also, when the. Uh, sorry, Mike. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, also with the grenade, if you look frame by frame, there's a wire wrapped around it on his belt, so it stays there when the lever flies, when the spoon flies off. <laughs> and it's, it's, like an, it's, it's interesting, too, because before the scene, you see him take a knife out and he cuts the tape yeah. around the top, which was interesting because these the Mark II's didn't have a safety latch. That was a later so they would tape them after yeah. the war. Yep. Yeah, so they tape him and shit. So that was like interesting that they get that, and then it's just like, okay, who's got the wire to... You know, to keep this thing, make the scene work. <laughs> so. The um, the, the the thing I thought it happened was the explosion is so minimal in the scene. I thought it was the fuse going off, but not the actual grenade. Like something, like there was a malfunction. Like there was because, a dud or something. Yeah, because there's so much. Well, or 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 like because because a fuse going off. Uh, if you if you um, again these it's those fire this. The explosions in here were majoritively ash and dirt. Not the, the explosions not, were terrible. They Let's were just put it that way. Yes, they were, but they were not wind talkers terrible. Yeah, they weren't the big it fireballs. Was, they, Jesus, well, Christ. they kind of were. They they, kind I, of I mean, were. there were well, fireballs, yeah. but they were not fire balls. There was it was dirt, it was dirt, dirt and aerosol it, with yeah. some push with some fire. The, the amount of smoke and residual was the same, but the fire was not. You're correct. Yeah, yeah. It's not. It's not wind talkers. Uh, Ninety gallon gasoline drums on a hill. Okay. In slow. It's motion, not broken yeah. air. Hit me in the ear. Yeah. <laughs> it's not. It's not broken arrow. Okay. Fucking napalm attacks. Okay. One so. of the best explosions, like of of that caliber, like of that situation. One of the best explosions you could possibly see is Breaking Bad when Gus gets blown up. Uh, yeah. The door flies up. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That is that is what that would look like. It's just a bunch of shit moving fast, no fire. Boom. Pressure change. Massive yeah. pressure and change. Honestly, that is more scary, in my opinion. Oh god, like, yeah. Just the, it's yeah, the real just, thing always is. Yeah. Just like that. The 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 force, you know, the, the oh, Well that's god. that's what most explosives are. Like artillery, if you've seen it go like actually hit like live rounds, it's not a big fireball. It leaves a little bit of uh black smoke or you know, dark brown smoke, whatever the fuck. But it's mainly the force and the shit that it kicks up or whatever. Like so that that actual what you just showed with that grenade scene when he threw that in there, yeah. that was not terrible. Because no. it was just because and it's then it's like it's down. force and dirt. It's not because well, that's it's smoking that's on afterwards because really... there is actually fire and there is a lot of yes. heat generated. Yes. And the smoke, that was fine. Like that wasn't but so it's like there's so many inconsistencies with this film of like, you know, uh technical things, you know, whatever. And as far as the explosions, like some of them, they actually got 
like they did them very well. They got them right. And then most of them, it's just lazy. Just the, the, the there are some amazing. Shit. Just having this up here, there are some amazing dolly shots. Like this is yeah. an amazing. Yeah, no, it, these it's, are some it's, amazing it's, cinematography first, in this film. It's amazing film. cinematography yeah. directing. Yes. Yeah, it's great. Yes, when they're coming up in like the first big battle, and you have like almost. It reminded me of the shot we talked about last week, Michael, in the casino. You know, yeah, the yeah, with Austria, I was like, yeah. fucking awesome. I was like, I forgot that. Yeah, it has been. I, that's a cool thing. Or that shot right there too with the shells. Yeah, like that's really like, cool like, to show I, that like these guys have been shooting. Yeah, out. like like I love push dolly shots. I love that as an yeah, editor. Yeah, they were good. They were really good in this film. I yes. love solid dolly push mm-hmm. shots, push ins, push outs, good pans. Oh, give me more of that, please. You know, it's it's when then but then you just combine just like this hill combat. The, it does really well because there is a continuity and a pacing to it versus the Japanese POW medical scene. It's just pure chaos. Wrong radio. Yeah. Oh, wrong radio. Did you see the wrong yeah. radio? They didn't. The five, three, sixes weren't used on the canal yet. They would use pogo sticks, which is a horrible piece of shit. It looks like a pogo stick. Oh, <laughs> so, <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. That's what they called them. That's that, cool. Yeah. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll finish up. Five, three, sixes don't really show up until, uh, Sicily a little later on, and definitely not the Australian episode. They have a carbines on the canal. I didn't have fucking walkie to, or handy talkies. The Orlikan twenty millimeter. So, yeah, it's literally yeah. every every fucking country uses these things. The Navy guys yeah. are great, by the way. Yeah, yeah, they got talker helmet and everything. Yeah, yeah, the yeah Kapox and everything. The best. Yep. Um, yeah. John Travolta. <laughs> Bofor, he's nuts. Oh, now you can say. <laughs> yeah, now I can say. It. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> Dude, those Bofors cannons, fuck! Oh yeah, they oh, they oh, they oh, show oh, them oh, really oh, well oh, in uh, oh, Flags oh. of Our Fathers. I think that they show them really well in that movie. Oh yeah, I um I've almost been run over by one of these things. Oh, it's li- it's literally like Austin Powers though. It's like it's like how could you possibly get hurt by that? But it it, it did almost happen. Uh, the big I, just to touch on it. If you watch in Guadalcanal Diary, they have like you know the Japanese equipment that they use to do the airfield, mm-hmm. and they have like those reeds, yeah, palm fronds on top of the of the uh, tractor. So I wonder if that's like an homage to that because if you like put it upside to side, it looks the exact right. same. I mean, different tractors, but it's just funny how it's like oh, you know. I, and I, I forgot to say what it is since this is an audio podcast, but it's a fucking tractor. It's a military tractor. I think it's a Clark. <laughs> Air, no, it's not an airborne tractor. But it's no, a Clark made it's a, the, the normal one. Whatever that was. Okay, be. so the howitzers, right? The uh, empty. Oh. <laughs> empty. Yeah, yeah you're gonna Nick Nolte's about. on the phone while they're going Dude, behind him. They're literally. Oh, I hate this about like most <laughs> war movies. It's like artillery, like it. The recoil goes straight back, right? With the recoil mm-hmm. system. <laughs> they don't jump straight up and down and balance like you got hydraulics on the fucking tires. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. that's exactly what they did in, the, in these pull it scenes. Up. They just got a little charge in there that puffs a little smoke out of it. Yeah. I, I'm pretty sure these are Australian soldiers too, because if you look at they have they have like the Daisy May caps, but they look like Giku caps. And you talking about the they, artillery guys? Yeah, yeah. Some of the guys I think are definitely Australian Army because it reminds me of uh, Danger Close, like mm-hmm. you know, just that kind of stuff. But <laughs> well, any cop looks like a Giku cap, you know, it's gonna be Australian, you know that. <laughs> Yeah, here we go. Yeah. I'm gonna rewind the it. Blam. Yeah, <laughs> those look like Vietnam boonie hats. They don't even look like giggle caps. They look like boonie hats. Like, but not, but not the right one. You know, this the shape is wrong. You see, like that guy looks like he's in Vietnam. <laughs> That's what I mean. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh my god, you're right. It's like a. You ever see stock footage it's of your like, artillery? It's, it's like just a like ghetto. It's like a. Mm. It's like a Baltimore lowrider with hydraulics. Right. That's what I'm saying. The hydraulics. <laughs> it just goes straight up and down. It's like. No, the fucking barrel goes <laughs> straight back, very forcibly, and the gun goes a little bit back, and then, okay, it, it goes back to the, it, yeah, oh, this guy looks like such a kid. It's like most 18 to 24-year-old guys who are in the infantry look like kids, because they are. Like, that's the thing is, uh, it also, to me, like, with this film is like, oh, he's just a kid. Like, in one of the, like, the monologues, it's a kid. It's like. Yeah, they're all kids. Not everybody could be a 40-year-old actor trying to portray a 20-year-old. You know? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you get some young guy who actually looks the part. Like, yes, they are kids because they're young. An 18- to 24-year-old male, for the most part, looks like a fucking child because they are. I was there. 
All of you guys in your 18 to 24 looked like kids. Of course. And it's like, I, I love that trope. It's like, this guy looks like he's 50, right? The commander. <laughs> and the rest of them, they all look like they're in their 40s and 50s, just like everybody playing a high school character on a TV show is like at least in their 30s. It's like, well, yeah. And then, oh, I got to have the one guy that looks like actually 18 years old. Oh, oh, God. He's a kid. Do you know how, do you know how old the youngest Marine was that was killed in Guadalcanal? Probably 16. 15. Yeah. I was going to say 15, 15, yeah. 15 and killed at 15. Um, I thought they did a good job showing that age thing in uh, the Pacifics, p- particularly the Sledge's side of the story. Yeah. yeah. Uh, like everyone kind of seemed like they were right out of high school. And just ran and vice versa. So I forget, I do not know the name of the guy that played Sledge in Pacific. Joe Mazzolo. Uh, but when I watched Bohemian Rhapsody, it was kind of like right. the Steve, uh, you know, whatever thing. It's like Steve Rule. It's like, oh my God, like, how was the Pacific? You know, when you were and there then, before you. And then, and then I'm like, and then I'm like, oh, hey, how was uh, T Rex's? Because. Yeah, uh, yeah. He's, he's uh, Timmy from Jurassic yeah. Park. Um, oh, shit. You're right. Yeah. yeah it's Timmy wow. from Jurassic Park. God damn. <laughs> And he it was really also affected. he was also in the River Wild with John C. Riley. Oh, wow. yeah. Huh. Oh, here, oh, yes, yes. Shoot the guy in the back. Oh. Yeah, not the guy in the front. To call, you know, why didn't you take out the machine gunner? That's how we do it with turkey hunting. We hit him from the back, so they don't know which one's being hit. <laughs> <laughs> I love all the Type ninety twos in this movie, though. Blammo! Oh my god. Well, another another thing I want I want I want to fucking address really quick is. As soon as they go up there and the first shot is fired, the, the fucking explosions start. D- mortars take an incredibly long. Yes. From the shot. Mortars, too, yeah. What? Well, okay. You're talking about the, the time. I mean, the Japanese had knee mortars, which were like, you know, right there. Uh, Unlike other militaries, like a 60. Yeah, like they still take a shit of time. You, but no, you're, it's warranted. But yeah, but the Japanese did have a very, very direct fire mortar, though. Compared to any other mill, like the commando mortar, basically is the same thing. But yeah, but what yeah, they're no, showing the here is like, hey, you're gonna hear, you're gonna hear the the hollow sound, and you're gonna be like, oh shit, mortars, don't know where they're gonna hit. But it's not like just this random, we're sneaking up, boom, everything is. It's like, no, mortars take about twenty seconds in flight. Yeah, they they were they were too fast for my liking as well. Yeah. Oh my god, and it's like, but it's the whole film, like it does that with the Americans and the. It's like, no, mortars, I, I've actually not, I don't think I've seen a film yet, and if I have, I don't remember, that actually shows mortars, like, how they actually work. Like, boom, you hang the round, and then it goes pop, and then it's 20 seconds before the fucking thing arcs, and then starts coming back down and whistles. They don't They don't make the whoosh sound like artillery does. They whistle. And it's like, Cross I- Cross of iron. Cross of Iron does a really good job with mortars in the beginning of the movie with it because they attack a Soviet mortar. Yeah, I haven't seen that in a while. So yeah, I, I yeah. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah, next yeah, year for at sure. Some point. But yeah, I, I just it's oh. most movies they they think mortars are like a. <laughs> I, 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 I would a say mortar artillery. Yeah, I, I I would say impacts they never ever get it right. It's it, they they never really do get it right. Unfortunately, maybe Pacific on the airfield. Yeah, they did a good job with some of that. Yeah, the black puffs and things, but. To bring it back though, our socket type thirty eight. Yeah, <laughs> the the six five variant. Well, that's uh, another thing. At the end, this whole like mm-hmm. scene of like the whole football team versus football team, we're gonna go charge into the oh, mist, yeah, right. boys. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I had a lot of last samurai vibes. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. So it's interesting, you know, the Japanese right before the war they had they switched the calibers of the rifles due to experiences in China and Manchuria. This they switched from a, a type 38 and six, five to a type 99 and seven, seven. And they always had problems during the war of trying to, you know, keep supplies of different units and such Lo- Yeah. Same thing with Italy, but long story short, the reason I bring this up is because um, later in the Guadalcanal campaign is you know, David mentioned earlier, when you have like the new guys coming in, they started arriving with the type uh, 99, seven, seven rifles. And the veterans denote this because at one point they're like, are they shooting Springfields? Like what the hell? And this is around um, like October to November of 42 where like you have these weapons show up. So it's just kind of an interesting little anecdote. Like the guys can even hear the higher pitch sound of the Japanese rifles. And that's when they started finding the, the type 99s compared to the type 38s. 
So just a little niche thing. I'm waiting for Mike B to say niche. I gave up on that. <laughs> it is niche. That was a cool scene. Nietzsche yeah. was a fucking psychologist. So <laughs> All right, well, here, here on the right side of the Hudson. Um, yeah, Ted 99s. I will say, uh, Mike B, you have converted me somewhat. I catch myself now. <laughs> niche is a me. French word. It means a small crack. It's a very small thing. Yeah. So. No, seriously, it does. it does. No, 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 no. I believe you. I'm just laughing. It made me laugh. Hold on, my dog's playing with a chew toy. Really? The type 96, yeah. That's a fun one. Uh, we have a friend who knows a guy that has like three of those. Nice. And he's over the age of yeah. 72. <laughs> <laughs> no? Okay. Boomer's gonna boom. That Japanese unit, at the, when we filmed the documentary, they have two of them, and they have a Type 92 as well. Ah, uh, so nice. It's going to be cool to see. The bayonet, you can put a machine gun on. Or a fucking machine gun, you can put a bayonet on. <laughs> a bayonet, you can put a machine gun on. It's late. It's, we're getting, <laughs> we're, we're getting yeah, I, I knew what you meant. I love the Type 99 porn. Oh, my God. So, I worked at a museum, and uh, we got one donated once. And uh, my director didn't tell me about it. And I like, you know, showed up. We were talking to bullshit. And we go upstairs and it's sitting on the table. And I'm like, you motherfucker. <laughs> and it was so cool. They're amazingly simple machine guns. Yep. That's um, not. Very much like a brand. That's office. not the hopper fed great. one, right? No, no that's the hopper fed one is the. Uh, I forget, but it's the it's the one that uses stripper clips. You have yeah. To, yeah, you have to go down. I don't know which one okay. it's called. I don't think it's in You're the talking movie, about actually. The, the type about 11, the, maybe. Yeah, it's type 11 that was, yeah. The t- well, it's the one that's like stripper clips. Yes, that would go in that hopper, down. and it would push yeah, it down. Five stripper clips. Yeah, the, yeah. the Italians did the same shit with their Breda model. Oh yes. yeah, I know what. Yeah, but, I know but there's that. but yeah. there's like the long ass stripper clips. But there's like that weird one that actually took like Arasaka mm. like five. Stripper no, so the, you so drop yeah, like five in there. The type, right? 11, the type three takes the Hotchkiss uh, trays, is what they're called. Right. Yeah. And whatever. Yep. Um. There, but there was one the type. I think it was a type eleven. That actually, okay. yeah, you put yeah. in five or, or five stripper clips, and then it would strip them and charge them, and, and whatever. It would try. <laughs> no, it actually did. It was pretty effective, but no, it they was, worked well. Actually. Oh, really? It was just a bitch reloading this son of a bitch, like <sighs> under fire. So, yeah, and they show up in the second one. Yeah, this one. Yeah, they had the hotch kiss. Like, yeah, this oh, is the. That, I, this, yeah, this it was really, it was really cool to see them carrying it fully set up with tripods, they, like through the jungle, like that. That was. They were nicknamed the woodpecker because yeah. of the sound that they made. Yeah, yeah, they're very slow rate of fire. I think it's like four or five hundred yeah. rounds per minute. It's not that fast. Yeah, and but, that's really because of the whole the the magazine or the sorry the feed strip. Well, and those fucking so things fast, weigh like sixty pounds, just the gun itself. Well, like crew, they're really heavy. Weapon. Oh yeah, they're 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 basically they're, like improved versions of First World War French Hotchkiss machine guns, but like they didn't improve the weight or anything. Like they worked, but you had to actually um with, with the Type Three, you had to actually lubricate the uh, trays and the rounds. And it actually had a bristle in the um, right before it goes into the uh, uh, receiver on the yeah, feed tray cover. There. There's a little brush that you'd put oil on that would oil the rounds to go through. You so, can see the cap right there in that fo- in that picture, right, right there. And, but, yeah, that right yeah, there. Yeah. And it was like you had to do that. So it's a very high maintenance <laughs> weapon, but when it was firing well, man, yeah, they were known to be incredibly reliable. Yeah, they were. And, uh, you just had to know how to run them, I, just like the CSRG 15, like. They were very reliable yeah. when you knew how to run them. You ran them correctly. So, mm-hmm. yep. It was so, I just, I have a soft spot for those. I had a chance to buy a parts kit a few years ago, and I'm going to forever kick myself. I didn't, but so cool. And type 14. You see a lot of them. That was neat to see. Okay. Guy commits suicide with one. Uh, okay. okay, Mike B, I, I have a question for you. And this might be a loaded question. Tell me if it's too much to answer with the time we have left, but. Are these dangerous? It's the wrong Nambu. Okay, what Nambu is dangerous then? 94. As you put your head in your hands, like I just like because, slapped your grandmother. Uh... <laughs> Mike, do you want to talk about this? Or me too? I mean, well, the time ninety four, the the older version. Um, so it's like on a Luger where the striker. 
assembly pushes out from the side of the slide, basically. Okay. And with a, a Type 94 is you could theoretically, if you, it's just like a hammer being dropped on a gun that doesn't have the fucking hammer lock. But I've done it. It's not technically theoretically, but you can do it. Sure, but what I'm, gun, I'm yeah. explaining yeah. is like it's like it's like a hammer fired handgun it doesn't have the bar lock that prevents the hammer from actually hitting the firing pin when the hammer's dropped. Uh, you can actually uh, take your hand or something and hit it hard enough; it'll cause the round to go off. Same thing with the striker on the Type 94 is this little uh, it, it's a it's a hinge plate that sticks out of the side. You could put in a force on there theoretically, you just. To, to have the striker yeah. come forward, hit the fucking primer, whatever. You could. And okay. it has happened because people don't know the fucking firearm. They don't know the mechanism. Right. They don't know whatever. And so it can happen, just like on any hammer fire, like I just explained. Are they dangerous? No more than any other handgun or rifle that people are aware of, in, whatever, right. in my opinion. Right. So, hey, un Unfortunately, a lot of my Japanese collection was very much hindered from the days of not knowing enough of my own research and going off the, you know, knowledge of it's a Jap piece of shit, don't buy it from FUDLORE. Yep. And, yep. and unfortunately, now they are being collected by FUDLORES, like, horrifically, now that they're, like, at least a $1,000 now. They used to be, like, 300 bucks like, five years ago. No max. Now they're, like, 8 to 9 to 10 or, or I, can, I can count, a <laughs> to $1,000 now. So. One, one funny thing is yesterday I was watching the news in my state, and some gangbanger was arrested, and they fucking, they were like, and these are the guns that were seized, and it was a Type 94. <laughs> <laughs> Where the fuck are you going to wow. ammo for that? I was, I was, it was like a, it was an AR, like two Glocks, a 94 Winchester, and a fucking like Type 94. It's stolen, ammo. obviously. And I'm like, yeah. I'm like, I don't know what to say. Like, fucking. Oh, that comes up uh, in the police interrogation. <laughs> we're going to ban reloading did you... presses. <laughs> oh, God. Look what Grandpa got from the canal. <laughs> um, but yeah, Nate, hopefully that answers. No, that question. does. More Thank you. Yeah, I but. I figured it was, and I I've been wanting to get one, but I haven't been able to find one that's I, cheap. It's enough. as dangerous as having a POA. From... We'll just put okay. it that way. It's as dangerous as having a POA. I, gotcha. I think it comes from Tales of the Gun because I remember them. Talking oh about that. fuck Tales of the yeah! Gun back in the day. Uh, oh. It, it was like my dad got one, and I was probably fifteen or sixteen, and we went to the range, and it was like, you know, trigger twice, and I'm like. And I, yeah, literally, you if you really want to do it, you can do it. But if you think about the the ways that it would really happen, and I, the last thing, and then we can move on, is that apparently those guns were given mostly to tankers, or supposedly given to tankers and to like uh, pilots and stuff because they were small or whatever. Right. So like maybe the, there was like a thing like in the confined spaces of a tank, like you can touch it on something and then yeah, whatever something but happened. Having experiences yeah. in tanks and, and and pistols and hip holsters, that's fucking bullshit. Yeah. So, you know, is that is that is that kind of like that 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 lore that the Enfield trigger was reduced or the the hammer was reduced because it was getting caught on tank hatches? The top break Enfield oh, spur trigger? That's that's kind of well, that's a whole different discussion. <laughs> okay. but, I mean, yeah, I know that's a whole different discussion. Yeah, I was just going off of fun lore cuz I read recently that it actually came with like the British doctrine or something like that that had changed around I'm the I'm going to say yes, okay. and we'll come back to this okay, on okay. the tank movie. Sure, tank no, 7 yeah. hand grenade. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Oh, yeah. The, the ones that the fuses were The helmet like, smacker. Because, you know. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I... Uh, I and there, overall, this movie, I... Um, there's a number of things in it that I like. There's a number of things in it that I think are really well done. Um, some interesting ideas, but at the same time, like there are an equal amount of things I don't like about it. So, um, I, I mean, if you, uh, it's, it's, you know, you can watch it. I think it's well done in, in several aspects, but, uh, me personally, I don't know. It's not really my kind of war film. Um, so I would probably give it maybe a five out of 10. Jesus. What about yes. You? What about you, Mr. Nasty Girl? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't get into, which is probably a good thing for the listeners that love this movie. Um, the writing, I thought, was absolute fucking horse shit. Um, the, the, and the, Nick Nolte is like, it's one of, it's one of the uh, prime examples of like the bar that I go, shitty military actors that were driven by Hollywood writers 
who have absolutely no fucking clue how people in the military work and operate. Okay. There's that. There's other shit. But anyway, um, I'll keep it short. It's it's cool. It's visually appealing at times, but the writing is so fucking terrible. The acting is so terrible. And the fact that like nobody knows what the fuck's going on most of the time. And it's just kind of all over the place. Like maybe that happened in post. Maybe that was meant to be that way. Um, yeah. It, as far as watching it, it I'm going to give it a four out of 10. It's just, <laughs> yeah, it's just, uh, it's what Hollywood expects the military to be. This is a prime example of that. And it's had a lot of fallings short. We'll say that. Uh, Nate, and then I'll, I'll finish up. So. I've kind of said a few things already repeatedly in a bunch of different themes, mainly of the fact that it is a con uh, it is a, is a movie that suffers from, too many directions that it wants to go into too many characters that does not spend enough time building a foundation on. And I think it suffers not knowing what it wants to be. It's, it's very all over the place. I think it definitely wants to be an out heart an art house anti-war film, but the way it goes about it, I would say is definitely new is definitely something that is different, but I particularly don't find uh, uh, I don't particularly find the way this film is edited and done in a way I can follow easily. It's it's very out there, and I think possibly reading the book would have some because Dave had mentioned that that re, that that I think reading the book would would give a glimpse into possibly what they were trying to do with the theme that the book might be giving. That is something that he had mentioned something about you know the thin red line about it being the, the, the fade, you know, the very thin line of, you know, losing it and not losing it. And I, I think when he said that, that did speak to me in a, in a way of, of some of the editing choices and, and the ways to go about it, the inner monologuing and, and that whole entire stuff and the question of humanity and morality and, and the whole nine yards. I think some scenes it does really well. And I think some scenes it does very randomly and, it unfortunately doesn't allow, I think the character development doesn't allow you to go that route. It, it's, it's too broad. It, it's not honed in enough. I think if they had cut the characters in half, I would care more about those characters go dying and or losing their humanity. You would care more about those things. And so to me, this film loses me in a lot of its different avenues of approach, whether it's the editing, the sound, because it's all in one go. You know, editing, sound editing and editing film is, is completely two different entities, but they have to mesh well. And I feel like sometimes it, it, this film, they just don't. And I think overall, this film tries to go one way, and I just think it gets lost in its own creatism if that's even a word, its own creativeness, let's, let's rephrase that, its own creativeness of how to break that mold and to showcase those things. And so for me personally, I give it, the, the cinematography really does pull it out from, you know, a hyena road burying. Um, but this is, I would say I'd have to agree, I think with the, with the majority, I think it's a five out of 10 for me, five out of 10 screen Mel Gibson's. You know, it, it works, but there's a lot that pulls it back, personally. Um, but yeah, that's just my like my two cents. I enjoyed it for what it was, and I think it is a very beautiful film. Um, but it it suffers a lot, I think, in its editing and what it's trying to do. Uh, I think, yeah, people who don't know shit about history or the military or any of that stuff would probably lo like really get into this movie. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah i i think it i think it does do really well and again military problems the combat bothered me but a lot of the military stuff didn't but um anyway brian go ahead yeah no i mean all good points I mean, it's it's hard to be the person to sum it all up but i mean basically to build on what i talked about earlier with my grandfather and things you know it's like when i watch this film it's i get the idea of you know what is life what is death who are we to ask these questions this movie doesn't really know what it wants to be 
Um, it's this strange, like, dichotomy between the Sands of Iwo Jima and Jarhead. Like, it, it's trying to, like, do all these different directions and things, you know, but it doesn't really touch on all of them. Like, you know, um, I love it and I hate it. Like, I love the cinematography. I love how it, it shows these kids from America in this totally foreign world, like, basically Mars to them. Like I mentioned earlier, like, you're middle America and you fucking go to the Solomons. You know, like, with the diseases and all this other shit. Like, it's just, it's a totally different place. Um, but it's just a very strange movie. And I just really wish, um, you know, they did more editing and they, they did a better job and there was a few more passes. And, like, it, it's really one of those cases of what could have been, you know. Um, because the shots there, the cinematography is there, you know, some of the combat's great. But that being all said, you know, I'd have to give it like a 6.5 only because like I keep coming back to this movie and I don't know why. Well, I know why it's because I, I want to understand it, but I'll never will. You know, it's, it's like chasing the dragon. It's like, what the fuck went on here? They had so many good things going for it, but then they made this. Um, You're going to catch me. So it's just, okay. yeah. You're going to catch me. 6.5 6. by 50 <laughs> semi rimmed. That's what you're trying to say. <laughs> exactly. For her pleasure. But like, <laughs> but no, it's just this very, uh, it's the American come and see, but it's worse than come and see. You know, it's just this film that um, this is very strange, but it's very beautiful at the same time. And I really think that in my mind, it's going to hold this like, you know, place of showing how exotic the Pacific was until they shoot a movie on Guadalcanal. Until they go to the lengths to show what the South Pacific looked like to American soldiers or Australia or whoever Commonwealth troops, you know, allied troops in the, in the Pacific. I feel like that's the only reason that I really put it on a pedestal. And it is respectable in that way. So, like Dave was saying, all the Sabo Island shots and things, like, you know, it's they, they really did try at points, but at the end, it was just not what it could have been. And it's sad. Dave, what do you think? Nathan, put Dave's thing in here. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, so overall, just like I said to the, the start, if you compare it to something like uh, Saving Private Ryan, you're going to be, uh, you know, disappointed. Um, if you want a good, deep movie and it has a lot of meaning to it, I guess you could look at it from that point of view. Um, it's a beautiful movie, beautifully, um, um, especially the, the green of Guadalcanal really, really sticks out. It's a beautifully shot movie. If you want to look at the, the combat scenes only, I would say look at the bunker scene. That's probably the, probably the best scene in the movie combat wise the rest of it's a bit out there um i wouldn't say don't watch it overall for from a from a military history point of view i don't rate it too high but it gives a good account of the u.s army you could say um if you know the the fight on on galloping horse so you can look at it um that way but i would probably out of a 10 10 being the highest i'd probably give it a five maybe for for watchability so to speak um, um, I'm still watching the 1964 movie, so the, the jury's out on that one, the, the thin red line. If you do move, if you do read the book, be prepared. It's a long book and it's very much similar to this movie here. So putting all the scores into the computer that will tell us if this film actually, you know, was good or not, we get a score of, uh, you can't do math, uh, Five point one. So, yeah. what was Dave's score? You know, five. Five. Okay. So Three down the middle. Five is a four and a six five. So this is uh, watch the bunker scene. Milk toast. And then have have fast forward ready to go. Uh, Milk toast. You know, um, yeah. It's uh, it's a very like we mentioned. You know, it's worth watching, but don't expect to understand it for like you won't know what and, the fuck is going on at the end of it yeah and it is nick nolte's acting just, and writing is is beautiful too it, it's kind of like the last episode of, of the sopranos what the fuck happened yeah, yeah. Like, you, you, you fuck really happened? don't know what the fuck yeah. happened oh he got shot in the head but like still you know what the fuck happened 
So it, and this is, it, well, like I say, dude, like I want to, I want to take the 20 hours of footage that they made and make a different movie with it. Yes. You know? <laughs> yeah. I, I want to watch the deleted scene. Like this is kind of like a Kelly's hero. Make it not end you with know? the sprouting yeah, coconut, a... please. I was, I saw that and I was like, don't you fucking end on the sprouting coconut. Don't you fucking end. Oh, you motherfucker. Like that was, that was the way I was like, thinking in my head. Like how cliche is that? You want to break the mold, but you end with that. Like, as they say in New York, go fuck yourself. Go yeah. fuck yourself. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's, again, it's just a very strange film, but it's so out there that it's it's worth a watch. I, I kind of understand what, you, what you're saying, Brian, to where, like you say, you keep coming back to it. Like, this is a movie that I have thought about. You know, it's like, it's not a movie where I just goes in one ear and out the other. This is a movie where it's like, what the shit was that? You know, like, <laughs> I, I, it's yeah. very, very curious. Yeah, that's the thing, you know, because it's it's so beautiful at times. And again, watching it again now, I, like I love that a lot of the the fighting scenes on the Gifu and you know on um, whatever uh, Galloping Horse Ridge, mm-hmm. like there are some really great scenes that I will I will remember when I go eventually do Pacific films in the future. But like, it's uh, it's just a very odd film, and it's like I just wish it was better. I don't want it to be Saving Private Ryan, um, but I just. It could have been this really cool thing if it just, you know, it's kind of in the same sense. It's kind of like eyes wide shut. It's like if Kubrick had a little bit more time to work on that film, would you fucking understand it? You know, because it's just very off and just doesn't really work. And it's kind of like this, you know, same era, same thing. It's just like it kind of works, but it's just off. So and fucking John Charles is a piece of shit in this film. He really <laughs> Nick Nolte is no. a piece of shit in this film. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Dave. And uh, we'd love to have you on again. We're talking about maybe doing the Pacific or something in the future. And uh, anything that you'd love to join us with, you know, we'd love to have you on. Okay. So. All right, guys. And thanks again for, yeah. for having me. And um, yeah, I look forward. And I've just sent a photo too to Brian. You can share it around. It shows the yeah. clover yeah, leaves. And this is a, yeah. a photo I've just recently someone sent to me on Guadalcanal. It's probably never been seen before, come out of a veteran's. Thing I've told, I think, come up a newspaper article many years ago. I love it, the it shows an 81 millimeter um, unit moving, mm-hmm. and one of them is carrying mm-hmm. those clover leaves with 81 oh, millimeter yeah. shoulder. Heavy guns, mm-hmm. or heavy, I haven't seen the base plate, which is a bitch to hump, sort of speak. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. right. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> I see the guy with binoculars, too. And yeah, yeah, you see, awesome. and the guy on the front, he's a squad leader, it looks like a team leader. He's got a field, fu- field wire, I'd say. Uh, spool, you see it? It's wrapped around his front. Wrapped around his, his belt. Oh, yeah, I'd say it's yeah. a field wire. So obviously it's F fire direction control. And this guy with a pair of binoculars, he's probably FO, or a lot of they carry mm-hmm. binos anyway. The guy up front's ammo carry. He's got the the clover leaf over his shoulder. He's got an O3 Springfield. Yep, yeah, I love the O3. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a great, yeah. it's a great photo. I only recently came across it this week. Wow. So it just oh, reminded me we was talking about the ammo. Oh, if you want to plug yourself, Dave, in your page? Oh, yeah, I've got two pages. It's Guadalcanal Walking a Battlefield. Um, it's a YouTube, especially in relation to the Thin Red Line. I have an episode called The Thin Red Line and the Captain Davis uh, Medal of Honor. And that's probably the best preserved battlefield, so go see that one. I also have a Facebook site that I, it's called the same, Guadalcanal Walking a Battlefield, that I update probably every day or every second or third day with, with new and uh, hopefully original uh, material, a lot of then and now. Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to leave a rating. Otherwise, Mel Gibson won't stop screaming. If you like this content, make sure to check out our Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram pages. If you want to directly support our work, make sure to check out our Patreon. All these links are in the description below. Until the next time, Scuttlebutt out.